Can you, can you guys just promote, him, promote him to panelists? Be chair, you can't be down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Okay. Call the um, Finance Administration uh, Committee uh, meeting uh, to order. It's uh, the 18th of October at 6.38 p.m. Starting a little bit late due to the previous committee uh, running a bit over. Uh, just in two minutes ahead, it's up and going. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, let's see, uh, community members, uh, council members Holloway, Mayhew, and um, Christensen are present, mayor's present, city, administ uh, city administrator, city attorney, and Mr. Boutte, Ms. Ferguson, and IT support staff are present, along with also council member Benson. Um, is there any uh, change or uh, any change to the agenda? No. All right, if there's no objection, then we'll take the agenda as approved. Hearing no objection, the agenda is approved. Looking to see if there are any members of the, there are no members of the pu public present in the council chambers. Yeah. Yeah. I can figure out how to do this. I'll look online. There are no non-panelist attendees. And there are no uh, members of the public attending virtually either. Uh, so there, all, there are no members of the public to make public comment. Moving on to the minutes of the... Gary, why is that a problem? Um, I don't know how to do this. There we go. Okay, uh, approval of the minute stated October 4th, 2022. Any comments or adjustments to the minutes? No. If there's no objection, then we'll take the minutes as approved as drafted. See no objection, they're so approved. Next is consideration of the uh, claims approval report dated October 24th, 2022. Uh, I have informed the committee members that I've received no questions regarding the claims report from any other council members. Are there any comments or questions from committee members? Council Member Christensen. Yeah, I had just one quick question. On page two, it's the blanket voucher approval document. Um, it's line number 43. There's a charge going to parametrics. I assume that I know what this is for, but I just wanted to get confirmation from the finance department since I know that we're talking a lot about additional 
uh, contracts, proposed contracts with parametrics going forward. Drew may have an answer. I know that council approved a contract with parametrics for a specific capital project a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, four weeks ago. Okay, that, so that's what they, I assumed that it was for. There are no par parametrics charges related to the to the community center matter about which we spoke. Right. Right. So it's not related to that. Perfect. Thank you, Drew. I don't, do you? You may have the detail there. I can't really recall the project necessarily, but Parametrics is a uh, vendor that we would often potentially use for design work on one of our construction projects and be more than happy to return at the council meeting, for example, to figure out what project that is specifically tied to. So I can Thanks. take a moment and pull up the most recently approved one, not the invoice, but the project. So I can at least identify what, what they're working on, if that would be helpful. Well, I think the question is about the invoice, not so let's make sure we don't answer the wrong question. Um, but were you actually just trying to make sure it wasn't a thing X or did you want to know what it actually was for? Um, I, I was just making sure that it wasn't under one of the other items that's currently under consideration, but that okay. hasn't been approved yet. And so you received, was that confirmation that's, satisfactory? That's okay. fine. Yeah, okay. there doesn't need to be any more. Right. So I don't think we need anything further, city attorney. Sure. Uh, Council member Holloway. Do we still have the voucher packages somewhere in the building? Oh, it's... No, no, I'm talking the, you know. Oh, the, the full pack. The yes, the packets, the, the voucher packs. Stacks of paper, not tonight, but maybe in, when we have these meetings, we can start the habit back of rolling them in in case we have questions. Um, we had the car. It's not, I didn't want you to carry them down here. <laughs> so, so here's the thing is, I think if we have a question, if they get back to us an answer, yeah. My point of view is that would probably be good enough. I, The thing that we, I think, didn't realize, so this is back in the olden days mm -hmm. before COVID, there was a time, LBC, life before COVID, um, when uh, they would bring in all the supporting details on a big cart. But I think the thing is, we actually created, by asking them to do that, I think we created a lot of staff work because they couldn't file things. They basically had to unfile things put them in a big card, make them available to us, and then later refile them. So it, I would say my own point of view is if they're willing to just answer questions we have, do we really want to sort of put that administrative burden, burden on them of actually requiring them to answer it in the in the council meeting? Or sorry, in the committee meeting. I don't know how much of a burden that really is. So that ah, do let us know. Us. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so when we have a manual process and we have paper, it is uh, extra staff staffing resources to do that. Um, if we do get a question prior to a committee meeting, we are happy to provide the the um, the actual uh, packet of information, the invoice, uh, and answer any questions that you do have. We do we we do recommend that if you have a question, reach out. Um, happy to you know provide that to the full committee then the full council so that they have the same answer the same response that we provide to one council member. Okay, thank you. Um, so just in response to that, I don't want to create additional work for staff. I also don't want to create the additional work with paper and you know there are trees and whatnot. Um, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't some kind of an, an issue there. So I I appreciate that. I don't have any further questions. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't part of what was coming up in committee. And what we're working on a workaround and interim uh, process where that information um, we talked at a another FNA committee meeting about having that information in a electronic format on the city website if you wanted to you know to dive into the actual details with that but we we really had, I think Drew's mentioned it multiple times we don't have a deep bench um, but we're happy to provide those details if you reach out and. Um, uh, get those for you before a meeting here. So I got comfortable level of service in which I could turn around, pick it up, look at and find it. I'm still expecting a level of service where I ask <laughs> a question, it can be looked and found. Okay. I'm willing to grumble and sit quietly. It's not something I want to spend us all night on, but I, my level of service expectation is that when I got a question such as what did parametrics get at, paid for, we can get the answer. 
384th Avenue sewer replacement project is the answer. Excuse me. It's the 384th Avenue sewer replacement project. If council remember when you approved the contract for uh, expanded services to the casino and hotel expansion, that there are other capital projects that the city needs to complete to facilitate that. The sewer down 384th was was one of those. It's that project. There's an accounting attorney. I, I didn't know it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or a finance attorney. I don't know what you're well, really called. He could do taxes too. He's, he's uh, very versatile. He cool, does his own you. income taxes, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so j just uh, to the point you were making, um, that's that's one of the features that the new accounting system will enable, oh, but yeah. we're quite not quite there yet. Is that right? Exactly. We're we we're racing as fast as we can um, to put some of these new tools in place. Um, we realize that level of service is an expectation. We don't want you to be frustrated with not getting a, an immediate answer. It's going to be grumpy. And so <laughs> we don't want you to grumble. We would like you to have a bit more of a smile on your face. So we are working on I think what he's agreeing to do is grumble between now and when you can do it, and then he'll be happy, oh, yeah. happy. Part of it is the ERP system's coming. But he's not asking it's, you to do anything. He's He'll just be grumpy about it till then, but he's okay with what we'll you're doing. We'll let you now. grumble then. Yeah. We'll have a party. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So then any uh further questions uh regarding the claims approval report? If there are no objections, then we'll take the claims approval report as approved for forwarding to the council on the consent agenda. See no objection is so approved. All right. Agenda bills. Let me let me just ask. I'm trying to think how our evening will go. I wonder, would it be uh maybe we could take agenda bill 22151, just get that uh resolved, and then we'll have uh sort of the remainder of time we can take on budget topics. Is there any objection to that ordering? No objection. If that'd be okay then. Would you guys be okay with taking us through agenda bill 22151 first, the uh, payment plan proposal? All right, thank you, Chair uh, Committee. The purpose of this agenda bill uh, is for the Council's consideration and adoption of an ordinance that would amend uh, the code, Section 13.12.040, Section G. Um, what this is proposed to do is, is to establish a payment plan program for delinquent utility accounts that are impacted by the, the pandemic. Um, we provided some background uh, with regards to uh, declared emergencies, uh, the governor's declared emergencies, and of course, uh, the restriction for municipalities to charge late fees and, and shut off through the pandemic. Um, what we have found um, is that um, uh, the administration does not have a method, does not have a tool with which to work with delinquent utility customers. And we are uh, very different from some of our neighboring communities. Most municipalities do offer a payment plan and allow the administration to work with folks who do need help uh, with regards to getting current on their utility balance. Um, the pandemic certainly uh, uh, was, was difficult for folks and we do have about 150 accounts uh, where we have a delinquency of a variety, a range of of um, uh, past due balances from 300 to 7,000, um, we would expect that with the establishment of a payment plan and in the proposed ordinance that was prepared, it would be uh, a payment terms of no longer than six months that uh, the uh, account owners would have to pay the portion of the delinquent balance along with staying current. Um, and that it would also give them time to seek some other resources. So uh, they would, they could go to the state, um, they could go to uh, some of those uh, sources like Helping Hands or um, the uh, the Hope Hope Link, 
but nonetheless work with customers in order to bring those balances current. So what we propose then, of course, is an ordinance that would modify code to establish that plan and to allow for a process for us to work with uh, individuals who uh, uh, have delinquent accounts to bring them current. The exhibit with this agenda bill is the uh, proposed ordinance uh, with those changes to code, and I'm happy to review that uh, as well. It is to section G uh, of the code, as I identified. Uh, it, it provides for uh, those with a past due balance uh, because of a, a declaration of an emergency. Um, that the finance uh, and administration departments would have the ability uh, to offer a payment term of six months. Uh, they would have to pay their current uh, portion plus the delinquent amount. Finance charges would not be imposed during this payment plan period, and they would not be shut off uh, unless they failed to you know, make good on their payment plan terms. And then, of course, that the uh, the full past due balance would be paid in full at the end of at end of the term. Uh, so that's what we're proposing. Um, because this is an ordinance, and because of the time uh, constraint involved with the the ending of the pandemic, the the emergency proclamation by the state, uh, the state also uh, removed um, the restrictions on utilities back in September of 2021. Um, so what we wanted to do was uh, put some, uh, a, again, a tool in place to help those folks to become current. Questions? Councilmember Christensen. I have one. Um, ge generally speaking, I like the idea of being able to work with um, the folks in the community who need that help. If we're seeing delinquencies ranging from three hundred to seven thousand dollars, plus the obligation to make the ongoing payments due. Do we think that six months, or is staff confident that that's going to be enough time to help people that are especially at the higher end of what's owed? Well, we're, we we believe that six, six months is sufficient. There's nothing now, um, and so other municipalities um, often try to you know. Um, uh, get into terms with a, a delinquent account owner to get it paid off as soon as possible. Uh, there are other uh, communities that are allowing for an 18 month period of time. We, th we felt that that was too long. Uh, there's also another community uh, with 24 months again, too long. Um, so we wanted to work in a 12 month period of time. We think that that would be sufficient time for them to seek out um, those places that provide assistance. Mm -hmm. So some of those big balances may not be as big of a burden if they can get uh, some help from those other programs. Okay, thank you. So, so I, at this point, don't quite understand what we're talking about here. So, cause we're using what sound like to me to be euphemisms, help. Are we talking about writing off balances? What, what are we no. talking about? No, we're not talking about writing off balances. We're talking about um, being able to offer someone an extended period of, of time with which to catch up with their delinquent balance without the fear of shutoff. Got our it. Current so, code doesn't allow for that. Yeah. So help me just understand what our current state of affairs is, okay? Which is, because I'm, I'm guessing some things from the information that you've given, like when you say a $7,000 balance. So it could be someone that runs $7,000 a month in bills. So I, I'm not really sure if what you're sort of alluding to, but what I'm wondering is, is so what's the current state of play? So do we always shut them off? We turn off the water at 30 days or at some number of days. Is that, are we like hardened? Is that, or do we, can someone sort of manage to get delinquent for a while? And then, you know, we don't like, what is the current state of affairs and how do we currently behave and perhaps why is, do, do we feel that our behavior is required by our current code or do we feel like what's going on right now? So current code allows for a, a, a balance to become delinquent. 60 days is it. And then they, so they're, they're essentially finance charges after 30 days, they start uh, being charged that additional finance charge. <laughs> if they do not bring the balance current, then at 60 days, then the finance charges continue, but at 60 days, they essentially are noticed um, that they're going to be shut off 
uh, and then our utility department um, provides for a, a door tag. Um, there's a very short window of time and shutoff occurs. When shutoff happens, then there's an additional fee placed on the account. The account owner has to pay the entire balance um, at that time in order for the water to be turned back on. And that is what current code. And so, and do we consistently apply that? So given the days that you said, I don't know if I'm going to say the right day, but substitute the correct day. Is it basically true then that you stop paying your bill at about 90 days without exception, we will shut off your water? Is that is that the case? That's, that's true. Prior to the pandemic, it is my understanding that the city, very regimen at, at these days, uh, you know, the system calculates the late fee, so that that automatically gets applied. The bills, uh, meters are read, you know, on or around the same day. Bills go out at on the same day. Very, very consistent, um, and it's just you know based on those deadlines. And staff has uh, stuck with uh, what, what code uh, requires. Okay, so that's the problem we're facing. Is this is our code? We follow the code. Mm -hmm. And so we're putting a bunch of people in a situation where the water gets turned off and, and they're sort of behind or it's about to be turned off and you don't have a tool to somehow work with them, help them was the term I think you guys used, to assist with some kind of time-based solution that gives them time to solve their problem. Mm -hmm. We're not going to write it off or at least we're not proposing to write it off. We're proposing to stop charging them. Late, uh, they're not called late fees. They're called uh, finance. Finance. Charge. We're gonna stop charging them finance charges, so that, but we're gonna put something in place to let them sure. pay over time. Oh, sure. so, no, no, I'm just asking a question. Is that that what's is being that proposed? is what we are are proposing? I wanted to add that. Sure, point of information. Point of back up. That is not what you're putting in place. Well, hold on. What? You're not getting information. That's I. Okay. You're not stating this point of information. Can she just answer my question first? But she answered it wrong. Take that up in a second. Let's, okay. let, let's hear it, and then we'll take it up. Fair enough? Uh, okay. You got okay. the attorney and I both twitching. I know. That's good. That's good. We'll 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 work through it. We're... So just your answer is yes to my question. I, I correctly stated what you're trying to achieve. Is that correct? Sure. Yes. Well, correct me if I got it wrong. Well, I, we're we'll figure out what they're worried about. Yeah, yeah, we're going to figure it out. So, uh, if if I'm not answering the question right, <laughs> yeah, then well, we'll figure that out. But okay. you thought the way what you heard me say was in fact what you thought believe yourself to be asking for. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Councilor so Holloway, your statement really was what is going to be our process a year from now? Okay. Okay. And no, this is not it. This is particular for the pandemic, and specifically says six months. At, they have to be current six months after the end of declaration of emergency. So this is an emergency situation clause only. It's not normal operating procedure. So this normal operating procedure is 60, 90, shut your water off. So just to make sure we're correctly understanding you, this is a change that would occur for a period of time. And then after some period of time, We'll just go back to the way we've been operating previously. Is that correct? That's right. That's your point. That's my point. This is an emer this is an emergency steps we do, particularly in times of emergency. Yeah, yeah. City attorney, did you have something to add? All I was what the finance director said was correct, and that additional clarification that uh, Councilmember Holloway offered was correct. And the language in the ordinance speaks to where there are substantial past due balances that accumulated during this period of an emergency where shutoffs were precluded by the governor's moratorium, uh, among other things. And then uh, the council granted the mayor authority to suspend shutoffs during uh, a time of emergency. So it's, it is this relative right now, this relatively unique. Uh, so we've landed in a set of circumstances that under our normal pre pandemic procedures, we never would have found ourselves. Correct. In. Right. And it, the, the finance director is correct also that other jurisdictions ge have general authority for the finance director or the utility director to enter into payment plans at the moment. But there's no and such general authority that she could here, use right now. Right. Yeah. And okay. We're trying to deal with this immediate set of circumstances. Got it. Got it. Council member Christensen. Uh, so my question is, to the extent that someone does have their water shut off, how significant is the charge to get it 
turned back on? Uh, well, they have to pay for the, the full balance. Mm -hmm. um, plus, I believe it's a $20 fee. Oh, okay. It's not as substantial as I thought it would be then. No, but they have to pay the full delinquent okay. balance. They have to pay it, it you know, bring it to uh, zero um, before their water gets turned back on. Okay. Has, so I have one more question then. Yes, go ahead. Uh, has there been any discussion about having this become how we would just operate generally in the future so that there would be some discretion? Well, the ordinance was is proposed so that in the future, if there's another emergency, mm -hmm. that we would be able to help folks after the emergency is done. That's why it's not specific to the COVID pandemic. There, It, it would be ideal to uh, be able to work with customers regardless um, but nonetheless, that's not way the current um, code is written. And we were hopeful to at least um, address helping folks, assisting folks uh, because of the COVID pandemic. So, Councilor uh, Marhala. It's a question though. So it says, pro, uh, a vague word, prolonged period, uh, Prolonged emergency, uh, but doesn't define what prolonged is. So if we have a blizzard this winter <laughs> and we do a two-week emergency, can I claim that I'll pay my bill off in six months? How do I? How if do an I emergency is to... declared by the mayor, right? No, no, we understand that. Uh, we don't know that there's an implication here that it would be for a certain duration, but the duration isn't defined. If you'd like to add in a duration to help um, ensure that, uh, I'm just, how do you characterize the two things, uh, pandemic versus blizzard? Well, it gives it gives staff flexibility. It gives the administration flexibility for uh, if the mayor declares an emergency, then I would suspect that we would come back to um, <laughs> update the F and A committee, update the council that in fact we're we are going to. Uh, offer a payment plan if it was a prolonged uh, emergency. But if you want to define it, that's that's fine as well. We can words with yeah, the ordinance. In, in duration two months or more. Whatever seems appropriate. Is that what you're recommending? Well, he's not saying two months. He's saying, why don't you give us a time period that you would propose? Is that, yeah. yeah. But we put a sure. specify, specify the time period that a prolonged declaration of emergency, you know, lasting greater than some time period is what he's have a defined period that might be sufficient no, if i bring it back attorney wannabes who want to play games who says you declared a blizzard i'm not paying my water bill for six months to get ahead of that i doubtful anybody's there but we as a council should be ahead of that so i do you guys discuss with bob and what you think is appropriate is it substitutes something in there for prolonged that says of duration two okay. months or more, three months or more, or whatever. So I think this is a, a fantastic okay. idea. I, I also think, so you're asking us to do this quite urgently, which everyone in council knows I despise, but there's a reason for it, which is you're saying we have an event happening, which we're suddenly going to lose people who may be quite behind a situation we wouldn't normally have allowed them to get into may suddenly now be faced with a problem and we want to relieve that so they don't land in that problem. That's why we're trying to move quickly. That is correct. Okay. So I would just add my own view. Sorry, let me ask. Um, it's a little bit off topic, but you'll see why. The uh, uh, I have managed to pay my water bill late sometimes, and I've always been, I've always found it remarkable that I then get a finance charge that's like thirty-seven cents. Mm -hmm. It's like minuscule, and the thought that's always been in my mind is, I bet we spend a lot more collecting the thirty-seven cents than thirty-seven cents. But I'm just curious because I presume that someone had to figure out who's late, calculate the charges, add it to their bill. I assumed a manual process. Is that the case or is this automated so it literally costs us nothing to apply that? Uh, well, it is automated. So it is the staff time to uh, you know, run the, you know, pull up or query what accounts are late, 
apply the finance up charge. Up the 37 can... cents is spent. Exactly. Up, you lost the 37 cents. We did. You uh, overspent it. Absolutely. One thing um, that that I can see would be where we would assess what what might be the finance charge going forward. Um, we are proposing that comprehensive fee study uh, um, in 2023, 2024, as well as when we uh, tackle the next utility rate study. So um, the reason I asked you the question is about 37 cents. By the way, my own view is you don't have to wait for a rate study to bring a rate to us. But plus, the question is, what are you really trying to do with this? Are you trying to generate revenue? Or are you trying to dissuade bad behavior? I would just say 37 cents isn't going to dissuade anyone from just about anything. But um, the the point I was trying to get to is I think I heard Council Member Christensen say that she was open to actually viewing something like this as a broader policy. I just want to say I am as well. And so uh, I'd be really interested. And the reason I brought up there for the finance charges, perhaps you could look at, is that even a thing worth doing? And maybe you come back to us and say, okay, great, we did this thing, or we didn't do it, whatever the answer will be. But going forward, could we have a tool more like this and possibly tell us, and by the way, that finance charge, just like, could we not do the 37 cent thing? So anyway, come back and tell us your advice and maybe give us tools, maybe ask us to give you tools that might be usable all the time, as opposed to just in this instance, we could at least hear you out on that. I, th I think there's at least, yeah. Councilmember Holloway, you'd like to hear that? presentation i assume sure. so we'd love to hear that if i know you guys have a lot of time on your hands to just whip up policies but uh anyway we're very open to that okay we can, we can definitely tackle that um i would just say for what it's worth uh having grown up in a a family that had problems paying the water bills the problem you get into is you know my mother had to juggle a lot of bills and it's a fine act they pull together, how they manage to do that. And what happens is they miss something by a day. And suddenly they can't just keep paying the one month and keep the wolf at the door. Mm -hmm. Everything's due. In order to pay that, now you have to miss this, which means that gets shut off. And it just becomes a snowball, a cascade of disaster. So, geez, let's try and keep our just trying to find ways to work with families that might be in a little bit of a squeeze and no, we're not going to let them build up $7,000 worth of back bills, but maybe you have some tools you can work with people who are in a little bit of trouble. I would really like to see that, um, you know, provide for more customer assistance for our utility. Yeah. Really like to. Great. All right. Any other questions regarding the agenda bill then? Nope. So the proposal is that we, uh, uh, approve this agenda bill to go forward along with it's a an ordinance so that we uh, the request is that we send it forward along with a recommendation or a request to the council that the uh, first and uh, the first reading be waived and that we do the first hope I'm saying this right that the first and second reading happen simultaneously and pass it on an emergency basis in one uh, sitting so any objection to us approving that? No, no. All right. Uh, then verification is that the city attorney and I will work on prolonged and redefine what prolonged period of time means. Yes, to put in a definition, please. And yeah. if you could send that out to the to the this committee, so that at least we're aware of what you've settled on, that'd be great. Obviously, we'll see it when we see the agenda packet, but but for the council meeting. But if you just let us know in advance. Then we have a chance to say, what, three days? That's not long enough. Yeah. yeah. We, okay. we'll, we'll send that to the committee, and then you'll see that, and we'll, we'll point that out uh, if uh, during the council meeting that we the change has been made. All right. So we'll approve this along with our recommendation uh, that it be adopted, and that do we waive the, uh, the second reading? And uh, because of an emergency, which is the ending of the state of emergency, and uh, and that it has our uh, recommendation in, with the modification of the specifying the time period. Yes, thank you. All right. See no objection. So approved. Thank you.
All right. Um, if there's no objection, let's just get through these other items and then we can sort of get to our budget discussion. Is that concern? See no objection. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's see. Uh, why don't we go to item five? Is there uh, an item that we need to just, there's a placeholder indicated, but is there anything that we need to discuss tonight? I don't believe so, other than we're just going to end the emergency proclamation. Okay. So. And is that, uh, does that, how does that work? Does the mayor just end it uh, or does the council have to act or? I think we'll have a document that states that it ends, but you, you needed to ratify when we went into proclam to the emergency, but you don't have to ratify coming out of it though. Got it. Super. All right, so uh, item six is an update. Um, is there an update on the Tyler Muni project? Yes. Good, uh -huh. good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good yourself? Just fine. I, there, there is Ms. Reader. All right. Yes. Uh, go ahead. We would love to hear how projects the project is going. Wonderful. Um, I will go ahead and share. So the project is going well overall. We're making progress. And why aren't you sharing? Hold on one second. There we go. So right now we are uh, currently still in phase one. We are moving into the two, the third section of it, or the uh, about broken up into thirds, essentially, what we're looking at, six, three, six month periods. We're moving into the last set here in the fourth quarter. We will, we will still plan to launch in 2023, so we're very excited. We've done some work to kind of help reprioritize things to ensure that we get there and really kind of working through the different pieces. We've also starting our human capital management section this October and working through that uh, for the next year, little over a year. So uh, in these meetings, my goal is to really provide you guys with the most important information uh, that would be important to the committee. So I've kind of broken it down to three bullet points. And then we'll add other things each month as they um, become pertinent or things come up. So to give you an overall budget update, um, right now we have kind of a few different areas of expenses the project has been working through. We have our Tyler Technologies who's providing the new ERP system. We are currently uh, paying them for our professional services, which includes the implementation and project management from their end. We have not purchased any of the new hardware or soft um, hardware pieces from a third party such as uh, cash, uh, point of sale machines, things like that yet. But we have started paying for the actual software service. And that gets billed to us every three months, but we are on track with where we expect it to be with all of these items so far. We haven't had to pay any travel expenses yet. So that was marked currently as positive since we've been able to do everything remote. Um, we will be starting to have some in November though, on-site sessions. Though the fees will stay low in that area because the gentleman that's going to be working with us is actually from Renton. So we'll be saving money there as well. So really being able to kind of apply what we have and looking good so far. The other big piece is our Barry Dunn services. They're our third party oversight company that's kind of watching the implementation and providing an external view um, from working with Tyler previously on areas that we can improve, providing us information, support and guidance through this process. We've been able again, to do all this remotely saving on the initial budgeted travel expenses. We're also um, with under the budget of what we've been spending there. So being able to kind of look at where this, these funds could be used for other projects and things like that related to ERP as we move forward, where we may have other expenses. And then there's the contingency piece uh, that we're working at that's we've been able to use and bring in data analysts and such to help us move the data more effectively. And then we also have a contingency with Tyler that we have not yet touched as well. So as a high level overview of what the project's looking like today, we have our chart of accounts, which I feel like I've been saying this for a while, but very excited as of next week should be um, marked as completed officially. We have our general ledger cash management we're focusing on, our accounts payable, our accounts receivable, and our securities for the next uh, handful of months. These are the pieces of the project that are really allowed the city to start utilizing the tools that we're already paying for as we start integrating new processes, that, such as the new cash sharing, the purchasing modules and things like that, that are not things the city currently uses. 
We're also looking at um, some other potential, and I know that you guys have seen these in the proposed budgets and such, software coming down the road that we're looking to see how we can integrate that with areas such as revenue that we have planned for later in the process without becoming too far out of scope creep. High level, right now we are still on track. There's no real concern across the board. Uh, we are meeting our deadlines um, based on the ability to modify and move through the Tyler process in the way in which the city needs to and not necessarily the standard process that was given to us. And lastly is the risk assessment. So overall right now we're looking really good. Uh, we've moved HR into the implementation phase. We're starting to do the initial analysis around the different processes that we would like to implement with the new software. We're finishing up chart of accounts and our financial modules are starting to be utilized and tested in our system. So feeling very strong and confident of where we are right now. Any questions? I have a question for you, Ms. Reeder. Um, actually, it's not for you. Well, maybe it's for you. You may be the person to ask. I'm just curious about how our staff is doing. So there's all the things that people who aren't our staff do, and then there's the part of this that our staff has to do. We have them doing just a few things all at once right now, actually a whole bunch of, bunch of, bunch of things all at once right now. Um, so I'm just curious of whoever I should be asking, how's that going? Do you guys have the bandwidth you need? Do you need any help? Because you don't want to wait until everything's, you know, the balls start dro dro start dropping on the floor before you ask for help. You want to see that coming if you can. How's it feeling? Are you guys have the bandwidth you need to support this? So I guess I don't know if I'm asking you, Ms. Reader, on their behalf or if they need to answer, but just curious how the staff's doing. So I think there's some good perspective and I can provide a little bit here and then if Jen or Drew or anyone else on the call would like to as well, of course. Um, honestly, it has been a little tough. There have definitely been times in this project already where I can tell you the staff is a little stressed, is a little worn out, and we're really working to try and mitigate that. We've done some reprocessing and reviewing of who can own different pieces. We've been trying to upskill some individuals so they rely less heavily on some of our more experienced staff and really help them through the process to learn this new tool. So I would say that there is definitely fatigue. It's fatigue we're aware of and that we're working through, but it's definitely there. And I don't know if anyone else would like to add to that. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think Sarah has defined staff's uh, uh, fatigue, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's definitely an extra amount of work. Uh, everyone has is, is, is been very committed, though, um, to finding and putting in this new system and sees that it is going to be helpful and implementation and setup is so time consuming. And you just wonder what it, what in the world you were thinking when you went into um, this kind of project, because we, we just don't, it, there's just not any more people um, to pay the bills or take a receipt or do the budget or, or what have you. Um, so what Sarah has described about us, slowing down a bit and focusing on these core modules is really kind of help the team ensure that we, we, we want to be successful. Uh, we know that they they uh, integrate together. So we can't stop. We can't just say, we're going to implement AP. Well, you need someone to actually do the purchasing. And so that's the direct service departments. You know, finance doesn't buy a lot of things. So everybody else buys things. And so we need that core um, uh, system in, in place. Uh, fatigue, great, great word. I think committed. Uh, we know that we've got a more work. We've, we've gotten some breaks uh, for things like the audit or uh, for some of the Im important work that needs to get done. We just have to focus. And we just told Tyler, we can't do it. Um, and we hate to do that, um, but nonetheless, we've we've been um, able to do that, and they've heard us. Sarah has been a tremendous asset in moving the project along and seeing that we need to have these adjustments uh, in it. So that's where we're at. Great, thank you. So. 
So, you know, I, I know I bring this up, but, um, and we, it's really important that we all stay within our budget. But having said that, better to spend a little more along the way than spend a whole bunch later on because you didn't do it right because you were too squeezed, right? So that's the reason okay. I asked. Just not trying to undermine the same message I'll say 10 minutes from now about stay on budget, but but um, at the same time, we just this is a tough thing they're doing and sometimes penny wise, pound foolish kind of thing, right? It's a legitimate concern, and also mm -hmm. from a staff perspective, we appreciate the fact that you have that concern. Now, to this point, you know, we've been able to address uh, you know, some of our you know, work level issues um, by bringing in uh, some short term staff folks um, and addressing it that way. And there are some additional positions, especially in finance, in the budget. Uh, you know, hope to be able to address this going forward. But yeah, like I said yeah, the sentiment is is certainly appreciated. Any other comments, council members? No. Ms. Reeder, thank you very much. Thank you. All have a wonderful evening. You as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, work plan update. Is there anything we need to go over? No, nope. self so report. Okay, good. Um, council agenda review. So, between, I always have to try and do this in my head to make sure I know the periods we're talking about. So, this will cover all of the council meetings that we're planning between now and not this coming council meeting, but the next one after that, right? So, there's three there's the coming council meeting, and there's two special meetings there's three between now and the next full, full council meeting okay got it all right so uh let's take a look at the um council meeting on the 19th oh that this is tomorrow yes the 19th which is a special business snoqualmie mill uh uh, planned uh, the PCI and the uh, proposed uh, development agreement, um, possible closed executive, executive session. Any changes, comments, questions? There's no objection then. We'll take that agenda as approved. And see no objection is approved. The next meeting is the uh, Monday, October 21st. <laughs> Monday, October 24th, roundtable meeting at 6 p.m., regular meeting at 7 p.m. Roundtable meeting is solely an executive session on labor relations. Is that correct? And then regular agenda, um, let's see, um, presentations, proclamations, uh, the meeting minutes, claims report, the emergency uh, ordinance we just discussed, and then I assume 22-128 came from public came safety from pub or came from public works. Public works, okay. And that's uh, a first reading, is it? No, this will be second reading. Oh, this, oh yeah, we went over this last time. I tried to make it one. <laughs> uh, all right, and then is there an ordinance related to the item 10? Remove that. Is that the right place for the placeholder? Uh, we can just remove that. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, just, item 10. it's an informational matter. Yeah. It sure. sounds like where the mayor will just be informing us of an action she's taken, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, committee reports, CD, yep. Uh, parks and public works. That's the parametrics item. That's a mm -hmm. non-consent item. Correct. Okay. F and A. Financial management policy. Did we? We. I take it we didn't pass. We did. We moved it off because of uh, agenda squeeze. Right? Is that what we did previously? It was voted to move because there was a. Um, 
update to the financial policy, which I believe were your updates you submitted that afternoon. And so it was right. requested to move it to the next council meeting. Got it. So people could have a chance to look at it. All right. So that's all that's happening is they're just having time to look at it. There's no, yeah. <coughs> Got it. All right. And then uh, piece that, whoops, I jumped ahead. Wait, what did I do? Oh, right. That, wait, that, should that be under F and A committee then? I think the financial management policy, it's showing under committee of the whole. Shouldn't it be under F and A? Yeah. Okay, so let's move it. Who's the note taker tonight? Is it city administrator? I'm wearing my city clerk hat. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean the acting city clerk. <laughs> uh, so 074 is moving up under finance administration. Committee. Yes, sir. All right, and then PCI, no call me more. Uh, Yes, Councilmember Christensen. Uh, just a quick question. Do we want to circle back and talk about the legislative priorities of this one or move back to the next one because of what's currently on there? I'd, I'd like to see us take a shot at it just of timing. Mayor, do you have any preference? Um, I mean, this on the 24th is fine. Has anyone submitted anything to you? I'm just going to go back and listen through and type out what, what comments were and happened to the, the okay. document. That's good. And ask them, I, I can send you to during the crime. Okay. And Mayor, you let her know you're either already are in or you've let her know you, what you want to see in there as well. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So that's going under committee of the whole. Right. All right. So let's add that to committee of the whole then. Um, can I just double back? And I'm just curious with regard to the round table is there any chance that that would take substantially less than a whole hour in which case we could add to that agenda the snoqualmie mill matters such that if we were to end early we would then be able to proceed into discussion of those to use that time would that be useful i'm not proposing to take it off the regular meeting just potentially add it i'm sorry i didn't hear the items that you might add mill site to the how long then? Especially it's training. Yeah, it's, gonna, it's, a, it's probably 50 Oh, it's minutes. a training? Yeah. I see. So we kind of know how long it'll take, and it'll take the hour? Yeah. Okay, never mind. And this is more of adopting the mill site and PCI plan. So we'll have three hours tomorrow night for discussion. And right. And then council would be hopefully adopting it Monday night. So we don't need a whole lot of time. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Are we taking additional Sorry. Uh, sorry, let me just refine where I was. I managed to lose my way. I found myself, Councilmember Christensen. Well, I had thought that when we spoke before, we were going to take one more round of public comment then on on that. Correct? Is that where? Yeah, we had talked about that. Are you? I guess my own thinking had been not like I had not necessarily. Well, I guess I wasn't sure, but I wasn't necessarily. In my mind, I wasn't necessarily saying a public hearing per se, more just time on the agenda that we'd let, you know, public comment. Are you thinking you might like to see a public hearing on it? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I would like to see the public have a chance to weigh in once they see what the updated proposed agreement is. I, I think that we kind of indicated that, that we take some initial public comments. So I just want to make sure that no. that to the extent that we've made that we previously said that, that we do honor it because I, I definitely see a lot of pushback if if the public feels like they were told that they'd have additional time and then they're not given it. Right. Um, so to the extent that we can have that in there, that would be great. Um, and I, I do think it would be important. So let me ask city attorney, could you just advise us kind of the concept? So there's a thing called a public hearing and I don't really know what all we sort of when you use those words what you're getting yourself into we clearly we want to have a public comment period and kind of tee this up for the public but can you kind of educate us a bit on public hearing itself sure a public hearing would require notice to the paper of record which is the seattle times and a 10-day notice period so it would not be possible to do that on the 24th <clears throat> excuse me and we would if you wanted to actually note a public hearing given those time constraints have to address the the timing of the the permitting period that we previously had agreed to this extension to the end of October with the applicant. 
that's different than if the council were to just allow public comment on the, the item, you know, as part of the regular council agenda. So to kind of clarify that, um, could we, for example, so, so just to be clear, and any public hearing we're required to do by state law or by our own uh, uh, municipal code, we've already, that has occurred. Correct. In bo with both with respect to the PCI plan and the development agreement. So we could, could we, question, put something like um, not public hearing, but rather public comment period, like tee it up as something we're, and could we then, even if we chose to advertise it, publish it, but not be held to the, not, not, it's not not be held to, but not be subject to the requirements of a public hearing, rather it would just be us inviting comment from the public. Could we do something like that? Is that a permissible thing? I believe that it's permissible. There's a hand behind you. That's yeah, why I'm looking at it. What's that? Not for the PCI plan. Right, has Correct. Oh, yes, yes. We agreement. can't take right. comment on that. That's right. Plan you're considering in a closed record context, but on the development agreement, yes, I believe it would be permissible. Okay. Could come with some other considerations that I can address tomorrow evening. All right, hold on. Let me, uh, Mayor, you wanted to make a comment? Well, that's what I was going to make. That we oh, could thank you. communicate it out to the public that the agenda and, and you know, people can come and speak to it, but it have to be a development agreement. All right. Let me use my invisible eyes in the back of my head. Councilmember Holloway. Well, can we just, at the end of the development agreement, put public comment to be taken and notice those, you know, the applicant and the opposition that next council meeting will be taking public comment on the development agreement. That could be done. Yes. That, as I said, there's, there's some other considerations that we could, I'd rather not talk about. And I, we don't have members of the public here, but I know we are recording and so on. So we could talk about those tomorrow night. As well. And so would your advice be then city attorney that were we to make a decision about, hmm, I'm trying to figure out what you're trying to advise us in terms of putting or not putting something on the agenda. Uh, I'm not trying to advise you one way or the other, just that I, I would advise you about some other possible uh, consequences, you know, that could happen one way or the other. So it just would bear merit a little fuller conversation. The committee could have a quick executive session out as well, if you wanted to do that, just so that we were off. If there's no um, objection, I'd like to propose we go into executive session. Second. Okay. Uh, we'll. Uh, you'll have to help me with the wording. Sorry. I don't want to, but I'm not going to object. <laughs> so uh, we'll go into executive session for 15 minutes. Sure. Uh, we'll invite the city attorney, city administrator, mayor to uh, join the committee members as well as just the three of us. And... Uh, uh, what else uh, need uh, do I need to say in terms of notifying? It would be pursuant to RCW 42-30-110, uh, paren one, paren small i, uh, per small uh, three, uh, Roman numeral three, small Roman numeral three, uh, to discuss potential litigation. All right. And we're turning 15 minutes. Uh, if we could turn off the broadcast and the recording. Yeah, we can just stop. Okay, off. never mind. We'll just exit the room and we'll be back. Uh, Mayor, go ahead. But why wouldn't we just do this tomorrow as part of, because we are meeting on the mill site, we could do it as part of the executive session tomorrow. This way, I mean, they have a presentation. You have the ERP, or, yeah, the, what, not the ERP, but the IR, ERR and everything else you're going to see tonight. And that you're going to take 15 minutes away from that. So I'm just trying to ascertain what should be on the agenda. We're being asked to, I'm just trying to figure out, there was sort of an implication that we should learn something before we make a decision on the agenda. I can be faster than 15 minutes, Mayor. Yeah. Five minutes? Sure. All right. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes um, uh, at uh, 7.40. All right, let's go. All right, uh, calling uh, or coming out of executive session for the um, f and committee at 7.45 p.m. Uh, picking back up on looking at the agenda for uh, the 24th of October. Um, uh, committee members, if it's okay, we'll add, let's uh, add, uh, let me see how the order works here. 
add uh, to uh, the public comment period a specific item on public comment on proposed Snoqualmie Mill Development Agreement. Um, and well, like I said, can we just on the agenda? Uh, the well, let's, don't you want to get it up front? Take comment up front, so then we can move on. So then, so then let's reorder the uh, agenda. The yeah. So let's reorder the agenda so that we take up the Snoqualmie Mill Development Agreement Project. immediately following the consent agenda. Yes. Oh, okay. We'll do that. Would that be acceptable, or do you prefer it before the consent agenda? Anyone? And do public comment. It's not for the consent agenda. <laughs> no, no, no. So it'd be. So, so we'll put it under public comments. We'll take um, a specific item under public comment of comment on the proposed Snoqualmie Mill Development Agreement. And then the question would be, when do we want to, in what order do we then want to take up the a, AB 22-114? Should we do it next or after the consent agenda? Any preference? I'm just wondering why we can do public comment during Committee of the Whole. Do you have... Well, right, but then you have potentially a lot of people... Here for that? Yeah. Whereas if we just move that matter, then we can move on to other items with that matter resolved one way or the other. Move it up there. That's fine. Yeah. So uh, any preference at following consent agenda or after? The consent agenda looks pretty straightforward. Maybe just put it right after consent. Right. That's fine. Okay. Do you want it after consent rather than before consent? Yeah. Okay. So we'll do... Uh, so following consent agenda, next item would be 114. And the next item following 114 would be 098. Then we'll move through the rest of the agenda as already discussed or as proposed here. Or with the other adjustments that we spoke of. Right. So just to clarify the only item that is now under committee of the whole is legislative priorities because we moved financial management policies under finance administration correct okay all right then uh mayor's report commission committee liaison reports potential closed session and adjournment any other comments items corrections additions all right, if there's no mayor, does that sound correct to you? Yep. All right, so there are no objection, then we'll take that as approved. See no objection, is so approved. Moving on to agenda for Tuesday, November 1st, special meeting. So Tuesday, November 1st. Oh, so that's a... Fifth Monday. Huh? Fifth Monday. Oh, is that the is that a fifth of week? Got it. I was just trying to do the math in my head. <laughs> Wait a minute, is that a committee Tuesday? All right. So then, uh, the uh, special hybrid meeting, November first. Topic is biennial budget. Uh, also possible possible executive session. Any changes, modifications? All right. If there's no objection, then we'll take that agenda as approved. See no objection and it is approved. Okay, how do I get back to the top? Should be better ways than this. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, we've been through those. We've been through that, that, that. Okay, Mr. Boutte, I know you've been waiting patiently. We would very much like to hear from you on budget matters. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Administrator. Uh, just to give a little bit of a brief intro regarding this, we have three more presentations to go through at the Finance Administration Committee. Uh, they should hopefully be relatively small. We're going to have our City Administrator kind of go through those slides for you. 
Uh, then we'll be having to answer any questions. This is the second um, set of committee rounds that we're going through right now. Um, following this, we're going to return to you on November the 1st, uh, in essence, to have a kind of discussion regarding what the final 2023-2024 biennial budget should look like, taking into consideration potentially all the amendments that council may want to provide to us, as well as answer any questions that could uh, very well be outstanding that we haven't quite answered um, in totality yet. Um, so following the city administrator's three presentations, we're gonna, then going to get into a presentation uh, regarding our internal cost allocation plan plus budgetary assumptions. Um, so with that said, um, I'll take any questions right now. If not, I'm going to turn it over to the city administrator uh, to begin presenting. So I have a just... question. Um, yes. Just uh, the topic of 22-150, Genneville 22-150. If I if it's what I think it's going to be, this may be a relatively straightforward matter for this committee. Do you want to just start on that so we can have that dealt with, or do you prefer um, the order you've got here? So I think that can what? Okay. Yes. Fine. Yes. Yeah. We, we've messed with your order enough tonight. <laughs> All right. Yes, and then we'll take that one up. All right. So with that said, City Administrator, it's all yours. <laughs> and also, well, good evening, Your Honor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the committee. Uh, Drew's asked me to talk about three de departments this evening, the uh, executive department, uh, the city clerk, and the uh, communications department. Before I get into specifics, I do want to talk a little bit about the folks who work in this department, and I specifically want to call out three people, uh, Carson Hornsby, uh, Dana McCall, and Gail Falkins. And the reason I'm calling them out is because they have been the backbone of what we are calling Team City Clerk over the last two months. You know, they've gotten some help from uh, the legal department, community development, parks, public works, police and fire, but the three of them do have day jobs, uh, very busy day jobs, and they have really been willing to step up and to help us through uh, this transition period uh, while we're moving to our new city clerk. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this evening. Uh, let's jump into the executive budget. Um, I think, as everyone knows, this is the mayor and her team uh, providing guidance and leadership uh, for city policy and implementation. Uh, the core functions are the mayor serves as the chief executive and also as the city's representative in legislative affairs. We implement the priorities of the council and we support other departments on major projects or, as Drew calls them, abnormal projects. <laughs> um, and uh, Carson actually oversees the uh, human services allocation process. There's only three people in our department, uh, the mayor, myself, and Carson. And by the way, Carson does a wonderful job of keeping me in line and trying to keep me out of trouble. He's not always successful in that. Uh, as far as the as far as what we've accomplished in this last year, the biggest is the transition, breaking in and the uh, you know training of the new city administrator. We've navigated through COVID. Uh, we've overseen the appointment of a number of positions, and we've collaborated with the tribe to amend our sewer utility agreement to expand service. And uh, through our department and every other department in the city and the council all working together. Uh, we've achieved major funding uh, for State Route 18 and also for the parkway. Uh, as has been our tradition as we go through these, I'll let Drew answer any questions you might have about the actual budget itself. Were you going to questions or did you want to say something um, first? No, no, no. I don't really have anything oh. necessarily. So. Uh, I just have one question. Um, so the mayor's compensation is set by uh so we changed how the law works or the municipal code works a few years ago there's a commission i think is the right term that is required to meet in the lead up to the budget and evaluate whether the mayor as well as the city council member should receive what compensation level they should receive i'm just curious is that commission meeting and has it made recommendations or is it going to just want to make sure that's happening? I, I do want to note that the last time they met, they did not recommend a raise to the mayor's budget, which I, sorry, mayor's budget, mayor's compensation, which I found to be surprising given how much our mayor does. But in any event, I just want to make sure that that, that commission is happening or has already happened. So uh, the answer is it's been off our radar for the most part. So it hasn't happened. Um, I guess we'll have to take a look at the 
statute just to make sure that we're complying with that um, and eventually get back to you. Okay, that, so. that's great. I think um, that it, we only just changed the rule. So this will only be the second time we're going through it. So, um, but I, I do think it's an important process uh, because as you all remember, we gave up the notion that this, the council would set those compensation levels, but rather we'd have this citizen, we'd have this commission do it. So we just need to follow through on that. And I do think they should have a look at those comps. Not worried about my compensation level, but yeah. Uh, okay. That's the question I had. All right. So I guess we'll get into the next any, slide. Any other questions? Don't wait. Let's uh, go back. Okay. Uh, go back. Councilor Holloway. Help me understand uh, supplies going up by 100%. So within your budget document itself, there are at least three items of proposed enhancements. One is the strategic plan. Uh, that would be proposed to come out of the executive budget. The other one is the council chamber's audiovisual upgrade. So in essence, that project would be constructed or at least built from the IT itself, but we need a source of funding to support that, and that will come out of the executive uh, budget overall. So there would be, in essence, an internal cost allocation charge from the executive budget into the IT fund in order to support that. In order to support which? In order to support the council chamber's audiovisual upgrade. So, so that there isn't any sort of available funding within the IT fund itself in order to pay for that. So in order to make that happen, we're in essence basically uh, charging the executive budget for that work. So we'd put the budget initially here, but then why not just put it in IT department? Because there isn't sufficient funding, right? So this is a new item above and beyond what they were planning to eventually replace with what the funding they have available to them and the cash balances that they currently have reserved. But they're in the same fund, right? Am I, what am I missing? No, IT is a separate fund. It's a separate fund. Yes. Oh, you're talking about the um, revolve, that's not, we don't call it revolving fund. We call it a uh, internal, internal service, service fund. fund. Yeah, yes, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. uh, got it. Okay, now I understand. It's, it's strange because as you can probably imagine right now that you're having basically one expenditure come out of the executive department. That money's getting transferred into or charged added to the uh, IT fund. That's how an ISF and works, yeah. Come out of yeah. It. So when we produce the budget comparison, purpose of that, having that separate operating expenditures column is to actually reduce that kind of double counting that kind of goes on a little bit in the budget process. So. Yeah, yep, got it. And the, it's the same thing as well with the security infrastructure at City Hall. So there isn't necessarily um, sufficient funding or funding built up in the facilities maintenance fund to support that itself. And so there's a charge coming out of the executive budget to handle that too. And when you add up all those, that contributes to the large difference in services that you see there. Can I ask, is there an, could you also have, instead of putting it in the this budget, could you have just put it in non-departmental just as a, a line item there? Um, yeah, we certainly, I mean, so we're making game time decisions, right? For the most part, very quick decisions exactly about where to or what uh, department to align this. This was likely a recommendation out of the executive office. And so that's the budget that we put it into. Yeah, the, the reason uh, that I raised that question is um, I'm just thinking it, sort of we do these analysis, what did the budget used to be? What, and so we just look forward two years from now, wait, why, you know, why are we taking the budget down? Or like, in other words, if you just, it's sort of a one-time deal. So rather than putting it into a, a departmental budget, which is sort of an ongoing kind of deal, maybe putting it non-departmental lets us budget for it, but not sort of skew a departmental budget. Is it, maybe give some thought to that. It's it, this is it's it's just a location question, not a question of whether you put it in there. It's just a question of whether this is the best. You know, maybe it would be more useful to put it in that other manner. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned that the IT revamp of the council chambers uh, could use a value value analysis. Um, I mean, how much does my next TV cost? As much money as my wife lets me. Um, <laughs> and how much does the next council chamber <laughs> council update cost? As much as we allocate. So I need help understanding the value we've put on or the dollar figure we've put on this 
um, considering where we are today. I mean, we're not doing half bad, uh, but I don't know that I need to be as far along the path as what this budget is indicating. So I need to see more information before I can fully support that. Second, uh, I agree with strategic plan. I just don't know that I'm supportive of spending this money to chase it. Okay, so I, I that's one also that I think we ought to look. Is there is is that the right value for the bucks we're talking here, or for the benefit we're talking, or can we do something different? It, it it's pretty pricey at this stage. Okay, so just two things I ask: help me get me educated because I'm not there yet on those items. So I think uh, regarding the first one, I do think we you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but have at least a pricing I have sense of exactly how much that will likely cost us. I think we've discussed at the last council meeting. Part of that is also uh, eventually to help us avoid costs in the future because a significant amount of overtime is generated just from having IT. We've got two staff members here today, for example, and so part of these upgrades would help us to at least reduce that staffing level required um, for meetings in the future. Um, so in essence, there there is potentially some cost savings that would come from that council uh, chamber audiovisual upgrade, uh, what we're proposing here in this budget. In terms of the strategic plan, I think that's something that we've identified at the council retreat itself. Um, I think organizationally, it's important for staff, provides a lot of role clarity overall within the department. We have a sense of where council wants to take us, um, and that helps with motivation overall. Um, it's surprising, I think, the value that a strategic plan actually provides to different organizations, private sector, public sector as well. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily, my personally, I don't, yeah. I'm not saying no strategic mm -hmm. plan. I'm mm -hmm. just saying, does it cost that much? It, can it, yeah. that, can we get that, most of that benefit at a lower dollar figure? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying let's not do a strategic plan. I'm just saying. Right. So that is something that, that much. we haven't priced out, right? And so in essence, the $100,000 that you see here is just a, an estimate, a swag right now at this uh, level. Um, so I don't know. I sense the gents coming up behind me a little bit. You may have a little bit more information. <laughs> <coming> <laughs> <up>. <laughs> All right, and Chair. Uh, the the reason for and in the budget, it's proposed in 2024, so it's in that second year, and so like Drew uh, indicated, is that it's it's a, it's essentially a placeholder for us. Strategic plans cost a lot of money, um, but our our goal is to define what our strategic plan process looks like. Do we want to spend a hundred thousand dollars? No, we don't. But we want to bring forward to the council. Then it's kind of like a a, a CIP project you allocate funds for the project, and then step-by-step step, um, the administration brings forward uh, a design or they bring forward the, the parts of it in order for us to get to a project and then the council signs off on it. So that is the intent with um, putting uh, the, these proposed dollars in for that particular project. So I, I, I buy part of that. I mean, we're gonna buy it. Yet. If this is a placeholder for two years from now and don't worry about it, then you get me back on an annual budget. Otherwise, if you're having asking me to authorize a biennial budget, it's not a placeholder. It's a budget figure I'm going to hold you to. Okay. Uh, that goes with the CIP too. I told the public works and parks, this is, are you making, is that project coming in per the budget we set? Mm -hmm. Uh, most of the time under and they're shifting money around. Uh, so it's usually good news, but I am approving biennial budget. So that 100,000 will be there. And, and a year from now, I'll question it again. They'll say, no, you already approved it. I'm not doing that. What, what, and if I guess I need a little more work on the 100,000, what should the appropriate dollar figure be? Uh, if not, then put it back in the ending fund balance. And when we feel comfortable with putting a dollar figure, we can do an adjustment to the budget. Um, that's that's something that we can, that if the council chooses, when we go through the final budget deliver, deliberations, if you want to pull that item out, that is certainly, um, you know, your your prerogative to do. Well, that, that's, that's where we would go is that let's pull that out. If the council is not comfortable with that, then when we get to that point, um, when we have um, a, a strategic planning process that we have been able to vet out, 
then we would bring that for you for a mid-period budget adjustment or adjust adjustment at that time. So my recommendation is that you would pull it out if you are not comfortable with it, and that's totally fine. Okay, Look, I, I'm grumpy enough to start pulling things, okay, but this is the period where we work together. I've expressed a concern to the administration. Uh, if you want to work together, we work together. If you want me to go uh, grumpy, I'll go grumpy. I got no problem. I, so, just, uh, so, so I think what he's saying is if you, if you came back with a more specific number, especially if it was less than that number, you, you might you might have a different outcome than if you stick with a hundred thousand. That's what he's trying to hint to you. I, I understand yeah. what you're what you're trying to. Um, our capacity to bring forward a, a very defined process and the cost for that, um, we we could be challenged with with doing that. Um, and so that's why we have estimated um, based on prior experiences um, in. Um, in other communities where we have gone through a strategic planning process. So we use our, our best judgment in what dollar amount we're recommending. Um, so we that's just letting you know that we will endeavor uh, to bring back those details. Um, and if that is sufficient or not, budget's a big, big decision for the council. We realize that, um, but you we also realize that you may wanna pull some things out and it's okay that um, we're not, in a battle, we are working together um, and we fully understand that. And so that is what we will attempt to do for okay. this particular proposal. All right, um, I would just let you know, I I would guess that there are many other council members that have a similar point of view on this item that you just heard from council member Holloway. I, I, I don't know, but I it's not for me to speak for some, uh, anyone else, but I, I think the notion was that this strategic plan would, is something that would be more useful sooner than later. So I was kind of surprised when you said 24, because my sense was like, yeah. there was a push, like, let's get this done. This could be really helpful. So um, I think you might be better off with an amount also with an intention to send it, spend it sooner. I know you'd still have to approximate, but that might be the path you want to be on as opposed to seeing it get pulled. Part of anyway, this. it's for you to think about. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on this? Okay. I guess we'll continue. Sure. Go the next uh, so the oh, main, I'm so sorry. Can, can I just, uh, just because it was on your previous, I apologize. I meant to bring this up and it slipped my mind. With regard to the AV, the council chamber upgrade, mm -hmm. one thing that you mentioned was that it might result in some ongoing staff savings, mm -hmm. I would strongly encourage you to put some kind of estimate on that because I think when council can see, oh, you want us to spend this, but then you think you'll save that, that that's a, a much better proposition to, to council. They can kind of see why, you know, you, you might get a different answer than if you are not able to sort of at least quantify some estimate of the benefit. Uh, so since we've already talked about these, I'll just go through them very quickly. Uh, council chambers, audiovisual upgrade, security infrastructure at City Hall, and strategic plan are kind of the three main items uh, for the next biennium. So moving on to the city clerk's budget, uh, once again, would uh, just note uh, the Dina will be here uh, starting in, starting on October 31st, as our new city clerk uh, will be actually be swearing her in on the 24th. So uh, you will be seeing me do my happy dance. Uh, when that <laughs> really? Music that goes with it? <laughs> I just want to see it on the 31st in costume. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to see the cost. <laughs> uh, the main mission of the city clerk is to ensure the transparency uh, in the legislative process and foster community understanding of government. And of course, the core services are they manage our legislative affairs, our records management, uh, support the elected officials, uh, serve as a volunteer coordinator, and really provide oversight of the city's risk management policy uh, program. 
Uh, during the last biennium, we had a very active uh, city clerk's department who accomplished a number of big projects. Uh, the submittal process for agenda items, the contract routing process, setting up muni codes and muni docs uh, for the public access to appropriate city documents, and really manage the documentation custodial requirements related to the city council action for over 200 agenda bills. Uh, we had a couple, of, we've had a couple of busy years, guys. Uh, and then the biennial budget. And again, uh, questions you should go to Drew. <laughs> Any questions? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> If not, I would just note that the uh, next slide wait, is completely wait, superfluous. Uh, wait, I, was just gonna, I, I know there's a desperate attempt to ask about a certain $508 increase, but we're not going to ask because it's only $508. So let's move on. Correct. Right. <laughs> right. uh, I said the last slide is completely out of date. Uh, oh, yes, it is. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, and finally, uh, the communications Here. department. Okay, okay, I'm being forced off of the, oh, postpone. There we go. Nope, um, I'm about to get thrown off, so oh. well, I can look on with you. Okay. Uh, the communications department uh, would just note that, uh, again, uh, Dan and Gail uh, have both have a long professional history in the community and long deep ties in the community and you know have been a huge asset in more ways than one just because of the ties that they have to uh, you know the city of Snoqualmie and the whole valley. Uh, the mission is of the communications office is to provide transparency and timely communication uh, for the residents of our city and uh, also uh, updating the city's website, social media channels, and dealing with general residential inquiries. Something I would just note is, is that we are a full service city and to coordinate communications from multiple departments um, is no easy task. Uh, you know, just in the last week or so, you'll note that uh, they had to get information from the fire department uh, to post on our social media and also from police department for other issues. So they're regularly communicating throughout the city and yes, just do a phenomenal job of it. Uh, in the last biennial budget, you know, we hired a new communications coordinator. Um, and again, we added a number of different channels uh, for social media. and. Uh, the budget, again, Drew, this is all yours. And we'll note the high percentage increase for one of those, but the base is starting from very low dollar amounts <laughs> in the supplies. Line. It's 3,152 per 10. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, what we did, right, is so we gave inflationary increases and then we gave department directors the discretion about exactly where they would allocate those dollars to amongst their accounts. So some of them may have increased the supplies line, accounts that they had, reduced their services lines and so on. That was totally bullshit. <laughs> Sometimes when I do a presentation and it's 3,000%, it says... NA and I just say, oh, it looks like we not kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> looks really? like we forgot to fix that do you, formula. <laughs> do that. <laughs> no, I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wouldn't, but I'm some know. people do. <laughs> and I'm on their side usually. You know, as many of you know, I was raised by an accountant. So uh uh Someday I'll tell you all my father's accounting jokes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and looking, see, forward, I'd laugh at him. I'd laugh at him. Uh, and looking forward to uh, next year, uh, that we'll be doing a community survey, a uh, website redesign that's underway, could be could probably be launched by the end of this year. And you now this is a little inside baseball, but very important that we've added graphics and a video capability uh, to be able to do a lot of the presentation materials that you'll see on social media in-house. So that would conclude my report and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. I have a, I have a question on that. It's not, 
not to sound like a cynic, but I've been on the council for six years ish, just under. This will be the third website redesign in that <laughs> period. It appears that we have to keep doing that. Is this um something that kind of fits in with the existing staff, or is that something you're having to spend, you know, a significant amount of external money on as well? Uh, it's mostly being done in house. Got it. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. It, Go ahead. I was going to say, I think we get a free upgrade. Yeah. So we get oh, a free website yeah, yeah. every so many years. Yeah. I mean, it's it's part of the software package that we right. use, the greater software package that we use to operate the city. She had me at free. Yeah. yeah so we, we get a, <laughs> when they update their software, we get to update our website for free. Right. All right. So that was a lot of fun. Now we're going to have more fun. Uh, <laughs> We're gonna move into a presentation regarding our internal cost allocation plan plus budgetary assumptions. So fasten your seatbelts. All right, um, so the first question, so we're gonna start off with some of the basics, right? For the most part, and then we'll kind of dive into our uh, four kind of cost centers that we typically allocate out to the different funds and departments overall. Um, question you might ask is what is cost allocation? Well, cost allocation is a method to determine and assign the cost of internal services, such as finance and IT, to the users of those services, such as police and fire. If you're thinking about, you know, imagine the city of Squawney is just the police department itself. You would still need to have finance staff. You'd still need to have someone supporting HR. You'd probably still need someone to handle payroll, maybe a, someone to oversee the police chief, for example. All those costs, you know, within that police department would get assigned to that specific police department. And so what we're trying to do here is it's not just the police department itself. We have a finance department, HR that handles or at least serves multiple different services across the city, direct services across the city, such as fire, parks, maintenance, and so on. But in order for us to see a hand raised. Promote me. Okay. I got kicked off. Could you just promote me back again? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, go ahead. All right. And so um, in essence, what we're trying to do is we're trying to assign those costs to those direct service kind of departments overall. So cost allocation thereby enables kind of local governments to more accurately account for the complete cost of the services it provides to the public. So the police department itself is not just police officers and sergeant detectives. It's also part of my time. It's part of Jen's time because we're supporting the police department too. The term allocation implies that there is no overly precise method available for charging a cost. We don't send an invoice to the police department and say, hey, uh, this is for my time that I've spent so far on the police car take home program, for example, therefore you need to pay the finance department. That's just not um, reasonable or efficient within kind of local government for us to do. So there is no overly precise method available for charging costs. So an organization using as an approximate method. And we'll get into some of those approximate methods that we use. So uh, just a word on kind of two different costs that we have overall in the city. So a total department or fund cost is equal to direct costs plus indirect costs. Direct costs are those specifically identified with particular cost objectives. So if you're the police department, it's like I said, the police officers, it's the salaries and wages and benefits that support those police officers, for example. But then there are also indirect costs and those are incurred for common or joint purposes and benefiting more than one cost objective. So. For example, the finance department itself serves utilities, police, fire, and so on. Um, and we need to make sure that those costs are allocated appropriately. And I provided an example down here. The cost of the Parks and Public Works Department includes its direct costs, employee wages and benefits, operations, maintenance, plus the indirect costs or overhead of support services, such as payroll, human resources, fleet, and IT. I feel like I'm repeating myself sometimes, but anyway, hopefully it's good. Um, so what are some of the type of indirect services costs incurred that we provide here at the city of Suquamish? I mentioned in administration, such as the executive, uh, the city clerk, city attorney, finance, uh, and within finance programs such as accounting, our payroll folks, accounts payable, budgeting, myself, human resources and communications. Um, IT is also an indirect service provided to other kind of direct service departments here at the city. Equipment replacement and repair falls under that, as well as facilities maintenance too. So why allocate costs? Well, because we want to identify the actual costs of services provided to residents. We need to make sure that we provide an equitable share or equitably share those costs of indirect services between the departments and funds throughout the organization. 
We need to ensure the accuracy of cost-based user fees for services such as utilities, development review, parks, or any other service where the user pays a fee or service. For example, if we didn't charge our time to utilities, you know, therefore then the rates wouldn't necessarily accurately reflect the cost of providing that utility service overall to the rate payers out there. In addition, it helps to relieve pressure on the general fund. So if we fail to allocate our time here, then that would mean it would have to be made up in property taxes and sales taxes in order to support that. In addition, we need to make sure that we comply with state law and minimize audit issues, as well as make sure that we get reimbursed for allowable costs from federal and state grants. So we can charge a portion of our time to those state and federal grants in order to make sure that we recover the full grant amount uh, when we can. Uh, just to provide a little regulatory guidance, I won't get into this necessarily, but RCW 43.09.210 um, requires that all services rendered by one department to another shall be paid for at its true and, uh, true and full value by the department receiving the service. In addition, there's a lot of kind of federal rules out there that we need to adhere to during this, uh, not only uh, the OMB's uniform guidance, but there's uh, circular A87 um, also that we need to follow <laughs> and all that too. So there's a lot of information and a lot of um, rules and regulations out there that we need to make sure that we follow regarding the cost allocation. Um, the basic steps of the cost allocation process include identifying the indirect services, and I mentioned those earlier, um, identifying the costs to be allocated. So in our case, we're looking at our kind of budget overall uh, for kind of all the, the indirect services, indirect services that I talked about earlier. We're then determining the allocation factors or methodology used to distribute the costs equitably, and we'll kind of showcase some of those factors in a little bit. We would then allocate the costs um, based on those allocation factors, and then we would update and monitor the data and methodology to ensure the allocation remains fair and equitable over time. So with that said, uh, this summary table or chart right here shows how much we're actually allocating in terms of costs uh, over the biennium. The total is $13.9 million, and uh, you can see that's kind of broken up um, across kind of the different indirect services. The administration itself is equal to about 4.9 million of that or 35%. And this really represents kind of a baseline allocation of costs and it doesn't include other costs allocated that relate to budget enhancement proposals. And that is something that we kind of discussed in the last uh, segment of our budget presentation overall. So I see we've got a council member walking over. So I'm gonna <laughs> pause for a moment. Yes. <laughs> All right. So next I'm gonna get into the kind of indirect services a little bit. So just to give a summary of the administration, uh, administrative overhead consists of the executive and like city clerk, city attorney, risk management, finance and human resources and communications. The budget proposes charging approximately $4.9 million in administrative costs to other funds over the biennium for the services rendered. Several allocation factors based on the work performed have been used to allocate the cost, and we'll show you a table here shortly. Two most common factors are full-time equivalent employees uh, for the budget period, as well as total expenditures, which are based on a three-year average overall. Um, to continue the summary, approximately 50% of the total budget expenditures for the administrative departments have been allocated to other funds. The impacted funds include the North Bend Police Services Fund, the Non-Utilities Capital Fund, uh, four enterprise funds, uh, the water operations, sewer operations, stormwater operations, and the utilities capital fund, as well as the three internal service funds. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of back and forth going between the internal service funds and administration. And um, yes, so this is the first time, uh, just as a note, this is the first time the city has actually charged for more than just personnel costs. So in the past, we used to charge just specifically for wages and benefits of the employees in the administration. Well, we certainly could have in the past charged for more because there are other expenses such as supplies and services um, that also benefit those direct service departments too. So next, some of the allocation factors. The executive itself is um, allocated based on total expenditures. So I just, to maybe paint a little bit of a picture here, total expenditures, what I mean by that is, for example, if we have, $100 million, well, $100,000 of expenditures, and 
maybe 100 million is better, I guess, as a number. And maybe the police department, maybe that represents 20% of that $100 million that we spent over the biennium. Well, then we would be charging 20% of the time, right, of the executive's time and supplies and services and all that that's budgeted within the executive to the police department itself. Um, that's probably not the best analogy. Let's go with utilities. Go ahead. You allocate executive on cost to cost, not on headcount? Yes, that is so, what we're proposing. So you don't say, you know, there's this many department heads that are being sued. Like you don't, okay, that's your answer. Okay, got it. Well, it's So we'll get to some of the issues later. This is potentially one of them where the allocation factors don't exactly represent how their time should be and the budget, right, for that should be allocated to that. Maybe it's not necessarily total expenditures. It could certainly be headcount. Maybe it's agenda bills, for example. We have uh, Mike and the mayor here. And so part of our issue over time is data collection. So who's actually going and doing the work of collecting that data, making sure, and then saying, okay, this is how much, how many agenda bills the parks and works department has issued based on utility versus park maintenance and so on. This is how much the police department and all that. So yeah, just to clarify, so you don't draw any conclusion from my question, I, I sort of, I, I was down in the sort of fine tuning of what's the sort of best way to do a cost allocation plan. But to be clear, and the reason I suddenly stopped and said, okay, is because they're certainly both acceptable methods. So mm -hmm. don't want to imply that they're not. Uh, so that's why I just sort of stopped. It wasn't because I thought you were doing something wrong. I yeah, I think we would hope to be more accurate or for reflecting how they actually spend their time and how they spend their money overall. Um, but I think that's something that we have to investigate that we haven't really had time to necessarily. Um, but yes, yeah, point well taken. Um, the city attorney itself, uh, we this is where we actually use full-time equivalent employees basically to allocate their time, supplies, and services. There are some other legal expenses that may relate to say lawsuits, for example, that we would just directly allocate to the departments or funds that were pertinent to that. Uh, for the city clerk, we use total expenditures, a three-year running average for that. Uh, for risk management, that was a complicated calculation that involves property, vehicles, and risk overall. Um, finance and human resources within that area. So we directly allocated the utility billing clerk's time, 40% um, to water, 40% to sewer, and 20% to stormwater. For payroll, we used full-time equivalent employees. Uh, the BNO tax that was not allocated because they're bringing in a revenue source to the general fund for the most part. For the revenue manager, uh, we assumed a direct allocation, 50% general fund, 20% water, 20% sewer, 10% stormwater. Uh, given what we anticipate they're going to oversee during this, um, if we were to hire that, if council approves that position as a part of the overall budget. Other finance, we use total expenditures, um, such as me, for example. Um, in human resources, we use full-time equivalent employees, and then we also use full-time equivalent employees for communications, too. So those are some of the allocation factors specific to the administration that we used. Uh, moving forward, we're going to get into the equipment replacement and repair um, department fund. Uh, so just to summarize this a little bit, the equipment replacement and repair fund consists basically of two components. Uh, the first one is a charge to support the eventual replacement of vehicles and equipment, as well as charges. And the second component includes charges to purchase fuel, replace parts, perform the maintenance work, and other expenditures. So there's really two components to this charge um, itself. Before we get any further, I'm going to hand out something here, just something that has been requested in the past. For the most part, we want to make sure that we provide it. Itself. This is the Thank replacement you. schedule. To address this as part of the presentation here, but I want to make sure that you have that available to you so that you can see pretty much our assets that we're tracking as a part of our ERNR fund and how that uh, we're proposing that um, the replacement schedule over time. And we know that was something that the committee has requested in the past. And we want to make sure we give it to you today. Um, so with that said, uh, the pro budget proposes charging approximately $3.1 million in ER and R costs to other funds over the Binium for the services rendered and to set aside funds for the eventual replacement of vehicles and equipment. 
The data that we're using in order to kind of figure this all out is based on the city's fleet management software system, otherwise known as RTA. So we're taking and extracting data out of there to support our conclusions. Just to get into the methodology for ERNR, and we're going to start with that second component that I mentioned, fuel, um, repair parts, and stuff like that. So we're using separate cost allocation percentages, um, and they're those separate cost allocation percentages are calculated for fuel, labor, depreciation, and other expenditures based on the prior two years' expenses. Uh, these percentages are multiplied by the corresponding budgeted cost to arrive at a total allocation. Allocations differ from actual expenditures as they include an annual depreciation rather than vehicle vehicles actually purchased during the biennium on behalf of each fund and department. Yes. For what it's worth, you don't charge depreciation. You charge a sinking fund charge. Very different terms. So, because we don't actually record depreciation, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because we're cash basis, so we don't, or modified cash basis, so we don't actually record depreciation. So, it's just because that, you know, but what you are charging, which is what you mean by this statement. So, I, I think you're saying the correct thing. I'm just sort of hung up on the word because what you're doing is you're making a sinking fund charge, right? Because you're charging them to put into the ERNR, which Probably is a sinking a fund. a little loose with the, the language a little bit. So like a fixed charge is what we kind of refer to it yeah. a little bit later here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I understand the point. T technically, is, well, not technically, just it isn't depreciation, that's all. So uh, you know, you're trying to just make it understandable. So, okay. So I just want to, this is for illustrative purposes only, but I just want the, um, regarding the bullet point that we had previously, that these percentages are, that we have separate cost allocation percentages um, that are calculated for fuel labor. Yes. Sorry, I just want to, mm -hmm. I wasn't just making a pedantic point. The, the point is depreciation, people understand to be a concept where I paid for something and now I kind of, over time, that gets charged. That's not what we're doing. We're actually charging them a, a higher amount than the vehicle we purchased because what we're charging them for is the next vehicle, right? The replacement vehicle. So that's why it's a sinking fund charge towards the next vehicle. It's not a usage charge, right? So it's just because if people get the wrong idea in their head, then it leads to questions like, well, wait a minute. Um, so you're you're always going to be behind, and the answer is no. No, we're not going to be behind because we're making a a sinking fund charge. So by the time we need to buy the new vehicle, we'll have the money for that vehicle. So they they they'll get kind of confused. So think about that. That's all. That's why I brought it up. Is mm -hmm. I've watched people. Oh, sorry, I've watched council members on this council get confused. Yeah. For what so, it's worth. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. No, I I get the point that you're making and I believe you're right right so for the most part it is not in depreciation it is mm -hmm. we are using a multiplication factor well a three percentage increase basically across time and whatever that replacement date is right for that and then subtracting out the surplus value of the vehicle but at that point it's not depreciation that we're then it's wholly something different beyond that at that point um mm -hmm. so it is it's it's you're we're I mean this is a really well-run city in this regard and we run a sinking fund a revolving sinking fund so that's outstanding um but you know anyway whatever we've spent too much time on it i, I just want to clarify because people can get confused by that that's all mm -hmm. we'll clean up the language we were rushing to get this done today so yeah <laughs> um so with that said i mentioned basically that there are separate cost allocation percentages um, so I know I have a table here that you can't really read, and I don't want that council member walking up <laughs> necessarily, so we're going to leave him where he is right now, hopefully. Um, but in essence, yeah, <laughs> I started to stand up over there. Um, I guess the point is made, so let's move on with that one. So talked a little bit about charging for the eventual replacement of vehicles and equipment. Let's <laughs> see. You said. Yes, that. You said it correctly. An annual where? You said ch charging for the eventual replacement. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's what you're doing. So we'll see if we can continue with that a little bit. An <laughs> annual fixed charge that uses straight line depreciation. Oh, now we're getting to uh, double area. <laughs> you're just mixing it all up now. Yes, <laughs> to smooth and reduce the fluctuation in charges to the department's funds. So just to give a formula, 
the annual fixed charge, and this is probably better, the estimated purchase price of the replacement vehicle minus the estimated surplus value of the current vehicle divided by years. So I think that is more explanatory of what we're trying to do here to eventually, you know, recover enough, put aside something in the bucket, right, to eventually replace our vehicles and equipment across time. So let's move on from that. So just to give a sense of this, of how it might look in terms of a graph, our annual fixed charge is fairly smooth over time, uh, but we may have a vehicle and equipment replacement budget that fluctuates pretty consistently. Um, so for 2023 and 2024, that shows you the annual fixed charge of what we're actually proposing in the budget. And that is the budget that we're proposing for the vehicle and replacement overall, vehicle and equipment replacements for this next two year period as well. Um, and so the goal is really to smooth out the charges over time so that there's not just one department that's taking a huge hit and you don't see these huge fluctuations in department budgets, right? Otherwise, it can be a bit disconcerting as we've seen from some of the percentages so far. So, <laughs> All right. So uh, that's the equipment replacement or repair. Moving on to information technology. Uh, the budget proposes charging approximately $4.5 million in IT costs to other funds over the buy-in for the services rendered. The allocations are based on full-time equivalent employees, all time, all IT costs, and we provide the the uh, kind of calculation here, the formula here for you. All IT costs, except for the IT project manager, which is tied to the ERP project, as well as the Duval Service desk, desk technician and capital purchase purchases for which funds have been set aside have been allocated to departments or funds are excluded from this calculation itself. So we're making sure that those things that relate to something else are not included as a part of the overall charge. Uh, moving on from that, uh, facilities maintenance. The budget proposes charging approximately $1.4 million in facilities maintenance costs to other funds over the biennium for the services rendered. Allocations are based on square footage um, and 100% of the facilities maintenance costs are allocated to other funds and departments. What you see in the middle there is the formula overall. Uh, the total, total square footage citywide is nearly 60,000 square feet. So we're using that as our cost allocation factor. Um, next after that, I want to discuss maybe some of the issues that we have and why we're proposing a internal cost allocation plan update in 2023 as part of our finance and human resources budget. Uh, some factors may not be the most appropriate in allocating costs, just as we kind of had a conversation earlier about that. You know, if you think about it, IT is full-time equivalent employees, really the best allocation factor, right, in terms of dividing or um, separating out their costs or charging their costs. Maybe not necessarily. Maybe it's service desk uh, tickets and all that might be a better factor, but we need some help uh, from a potential outside consultant to support us in this kind of endeavor a little bit. Uh, the second issue is the city may not have enough funds set aside to replace vehicles and equipment or IT hardware at the time required. Um, we mentioned that there's a 3% inflator, right, for vehicles and equipment, but maybe that's insufficient, um, right? And so I think that's a fantastic reaction over there. <laughs> Nonverbal communication is, you know, perfect. <laughs> But in essence, that is something that we need to explore, right? And explore because we need to make sure that we have uh, appropriately set aside not enough funds to uh, make sure that we can cover those future expenses. In addition, the city does not isolate fund balances by department or fund. This is something that um, creates a lot of consternation internally, primarily because, for example, the fire department does not know how much money they may have set aside for eventually the replacement of their apparatuses, for example. Um, and so that is something that is a need for us to, in the accounting side of the house, try to figure out, right, for the most part, um, so that we know how much each department has actually filled up their bucket um, at this point, and then make any corrections based on that. Um, in addition, the city does not, at the end of the year, determine whether department or fund allocations were underapplied or overapplied. So in essence, ideally, we would go back and we would take a look at the data, if it's um, total expenditures, if it's how many people did we actually have on staff right during this past year and actually allocate based on actual data as opposed to what we're predicting at the beginning of the year and then adjust for that through journal entries and so on uh, to correct for anything like that. Um, so I, I don't want you to feel criticized. I, I want you to sense that I'm 
sort of just making a comment. I'm, I'm trying to sort of get on your side on this, but here's the thing. So I did mention the six years on council. This would also be the third time I've heard. And we plan in the next biennium to do a cost allocation plan study, and we just, we just never get to it. I would just say you may be making that into a bigger thing. I, I redo cost allocation plans at my company not once a year, constantly. As soon as I see a component is out of whack, I go fix that. I just change it. I just, you know, I mean, go through a process and then change the, like, I don't wait for a big annual budget process. Um, so you may be making that into a bigger thing and therefore you're never getting to it. Whereas if you just treat it as smaller pieces, you can kind of knock off things and just sort of gradually get to something you're much more happy with um, just for whatever it's worth. Because like I say, it's the third time I've seen that said, and we still haven't got to it. Not meaning to criticize, meaning to make a helpful suggestion, okay? Yeah, it's um, something that I'm definitely interested in getting to. Um, I do think there are some, you know, not just ER and R, but exploring what IT should actually have set aside in terms of funding, right, for some of their hardware replacements over time, I think is critical. Um, that is something that I've been putting on the agenda. We did have a pandemic for the past few year period that does impact us. And, you know, we can discuss the degree of grumpiness a little bit right from council, <laughs> but I can assure you that it's a blender. <laughs> Don't worry, it's a blender, right? <laughs> uh, um, but we are we are following the administration's lead as well as council's lead exactly kind of where we need to do go with this. And there may be some things that we struggle to kind of get through adequately. Um but, no, it's not a criticism. It's just a, a suggestion that may be taken in bite-sized pieces as a way to get through it because it's you're just yeah trying to take it as a whole thing makes it a big thing that's hard to get to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so you know, with that said, there's the last bullet point here, um, and I guess we'll just kind of end on that one. The Finance and Human Resources Department is proposing to conduct an assessment in 2023 to assist with updating our cost allocation plan and procedures. So, yes. How much is currently in the ER and R fund? Um, well, I think we're proposing, if we take a look at our fund balance, anticipated fund balance again in 2023. Page. This will be on page 59. That's, uh, we're anticipating that we're going to start the 2023 biennium, 2023-2024 biennium with about $2.38 million. So let me ask you just, I mean, I want to go through this and ask some questions, but, you know, with a little time to look at it. But the one thing that I see here, which is, um, sort of a problem that I've, I've seen previously in our plan, by the way, fantastic job, absolutely fantastic that you have this and it's updated. Um, the, I worry about a couple of things. I worry about cash management with regard to the comment I'm about to make. So I worry about cash management and I also worry about people that don't fully understand the notion of a sinking fund, which is what this is. And therefore, get um, starry-eyed when they see a big number in the sinking fund and think that maybe they can redirect it. So uh, what happens is if we, and, and there's just all kinds of follow-on implications of doing what this plan says, which is buy a bunch of vehicles, then wait a bunch of years, then replace them all at the same time, and then wait a bunch of years, and then do it again. Whereas there's just enormous efficiencies you get by actually s s spreading that. So a bunch of the vehicles, some of the vehicles that are in here, you see it's okay, we're placing this one this year, the next year, the next one, the next. So it's on a more even basis where you're gradually getting through the whole fleet, but you know, a little bit each year as opposed to these build up the money and then huge expenditure and then build up the money, and huge, which is kind of what this is suggesting. So I know that it can be hard to think about, well, wait a minute, we just had this pandemic, we didn't buy vehicles, we're behind, maybe we, want to, we need to do some catch up. I'm not disputing that we might be thinking that. But what I'm saying is that doesn't lock us into thinking that forever. We can actually, you know, not every vehicle gets exactly the same number of miles driven on it every year. So you can actually sort of, 
imagine a path to a more waterfall type path and you would just be way better administering an ER and R fund that way than letting it chunk up like the way this shows. You're right over time. Well, you're right. You didn't say anything. You one would be right to say, hey, it's the same numbers over time. It's just you're just moving around on the chart. But what I'm saying is, yeah, but you get a whole bunch of wins, cash management, it, your your purchasing program, your ability to take vehicles in and equip them and get them out on the street on a timely basis, all, all the things you demand of your fleet department, just just everything works better if it's more uh, even. Uh, evenly spaced the purchases so just make that comment it wouldn't change the number well it might change them a little bit because if it probably wouldn't because you'd move some forward and back so the three percents would all just offset so you'd end up with the same number but you just have a more a better plan so it's something to think about mm -hmm. it, it, it's not going to change your budget number but it might be a better way to run the fund that's what i'm getting at so i think uh don has um in speaking to this council or this committee, as well as the Parks and Works Committee, has suggest or that they actually do hold back on some vehicles from actually going out and purchasing if they can. For example, if they find that they're low mileage or they don't have enough wear and tear on that. So I know he's uh, actively looking at that. In terms of the math itself, I wonder sometimes if you know if we have a vehicle that we're replacing every five years and the one that we're replacing every ten years, eventually you might find them in alignment at some point future that we would kind of also probably deal with at that time period as well. But yes, I think maybe a more even you know, structured approach right over time so that we don't have these highs and lows constantly, this kind of volatility that we're showing go a long way um, to kind of supporting that kind of even kind of cash management. So, all right. That's uh, any more questions on the internal cost allocation kind of playing a little bit? So can we just, uh, can I just ask, so what is the plan? Was this, is this our last committee meeting that we're planning to discuss budget or is there another committee meeting, f &A committee meeting where we'll also discuss budget? So there's another um, uh, committee round. It's our third committee round basically. So we'll have November the 1st and then I believe 7th and the 8th of November, we will also be coming back to the f &A committee to discuss the budget. Great. So like, I, I, imagine that there'll be a number of questions I'll have around particularly the cost allocation plans, particularly around the revolving funds. And so I just want to make sure there's some time for me to kind of look at this, formulate my questions, and then um, have a chance to talk with you again about it. So it sounds like the next meeting will be that chance. And um, yeah, we would always appreciate your questions early. Um, if you don't mind submitting to them us early, and then we can hopefully review those before we get back here. Yes, so Ms. Ferguson has experienced my evidently my recent idea of what is early, which seemed to be wait a week and then an hour before send something. So I'm, I don't know. Does that qualify as early? Maybe not ideal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Uh, so yeah, we'll. I mean, we'll all try and especially on complex things like this, so you can get us an answer. We'll try and do that. All right, is that all we have for tonight? So we also have budgetary assumptions. Ah, we this is the second half of the presentation itself. And so I'll try to run through this well, quickly. Well, let me ask, because we're very, very late now. Uh, is there any, like, I wonder if some of this should be put off, because it may be that some of us are tired and hungry and been sitting here a long time, and we may not take in what you say. So it might be better to put some off unless you really feel like we need to hear it tonight from you. Uh, how long is it? Uh, it's probably 10 minutes at this stage. Yeah. Okay. Is that our last item then? This is our last. Well, we have the agenda bill next after this 151, which actually ties into this part of the presentation. Um, it's better to do it now than wait until November 7th. Okay. Go. All right, so budgetary assumptions. Uh, I'll try to run through this quickly here, um, but to just start off with, we're gonna discuss expenditures that kind of the budgetary assumptions associated with this. So regarding salaries and wages, um, some employee groups have fixed COLAs, others are shifting to an inflation-based um, kind of COLAs for the most part. Uh, as a part of the budget, these are the percentage um, COLA increases that we incorporated. Um, 
the estimated colas um, are using inflation in the outer year. So when you take a look at the forecast table as part of the appendices of the budget document, you will see that those inflation measures over time. Um, Teamsters, we do not have an agreement for 2023 and 2024 yet. Uh, for police, uh, we have an agreement for 2023, but not for 2024. Uh, 2023, um, like I said, they're using kind of an inflation basis for that with a floor of 2% and a max of 4%. We, so we included the max here in our budget. That's on which one? Uh, police. And it's just for 23? Just for 23, correct. For 20, or sorry, for the fire uh, employee group, uh, they do have a agreement for 2023, 20, uh, as well as an agreement for 2024. 2023 is just fixed at 3.4%, but for 2024, they have a min of 2% and a max of 3.5%, and we included the max of 3.5% in the budget. For m and uh, the agenda bill that's coming next is proposed at 3.5%. You see here, that's what we incorporate into the budget, as well as we've also incorporated 3.5% for 2024. That council will not determine that until next year. Wait, um, what, 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 that last bit, what did you just say? So for the m and employee yes. group, uh, you will not determine what 2024 um, COLA increase will be for m and until So December. we have to appropriate no. it now. You do. So we actually have to determine it now. Just to make an assumption now. You have to make an assumption now. Which then becomes the max because that's all that's appropriated. Well, depending on what transpires right in the next year, we may find ourselves with some vacancies and therefore, right, may be able to support maybe higher COLA increases if there are certain vacancies that could. Gets back to the end. And the compensation study would be part of that as well. Yes. Yeah, so pretty. we are also. Um, we're doing a class and compensation study uh, that was, um, I don't know what, I'm losing my words now at this point, but not presented, but incorporated into the Teamsters agreement. And so as a part of that class and compensation study, there's also, we've added non-represented staff to that too. And so um, we're going through that process right now. Um, I see Jen's walking up behind me a little bit. I guess she's going to take a seat. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have to get into that class and compensation study, but we are certainly looking forward to that and what it may propose in that. Um, that will come out as a part of the Teamsters negotiation process. So we'll go through that first. Wait, before. the MMP will come out. Wait, what? Well, so there's the class and compensation study that we're You're doing it all together. Doing it all together. Got it. Teamsters okay. and then MMP. Got it. So MMP will likely come back separate. Yeah. Teamsters will have to go through the union bargaining process, basically. So, so sorry. So let me just make sure I understood this. The 2023 SPA contract is set. Mm -hmm. The fire for 23 and 24 is set. Mm -hmm. And you put it in at the max numbers for uh, under that agreement for both. Yes. The Teamsters is not set for either year and the police is not set for 24. Correct. And... You guys are aware of what the actual wage inflation rate is, which is nothing like those numbers. Well, we do understand that um, these are probably numbers that we will try to target as a part of the union negotiation process overall. Uh, we would note that we do have a agreement with FIRE and often what the administration would is prepared to do is to offer a COLA increase in alignment with those other, with the unions that we do have approved at that. No, no, I'm not questioning m and that I'm questioning the Teamsters and police second year. So, I mean, I. It's just, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about CPI. I'm not talking about consumer prices. I'm talking about CPIW. It's, you're over 6% just this year alone. So just like that's wildly different than what you're putting in there. But these colos are CPI, not CPIW. <laughs> no, they're nowhere near CPI is at nine percent. Calculating, well, particularly the which is it? It's the police that had the calculation, right? It is. It was based on CPI. So yeah, but that should have been rejected. You you don't negotiate contracts on CP. You do them on CPIW. No one does. Well, well we they do. shouldn't be. <laughs> we no, no. Well, that's that's your starting. You take a position, but if you're 
anyway, let's so, probably not get since, into that yeah, here. As I say, since this uh, potentially affects uh, contract negotiations, why don't we save this conversation for yeah. the executive session before the next council meeting? Well, okay, but I would just say, I mean, it's been put up here. So then the question is, you know, so then we, we can't question it. That's sort of awkward, right? I'm just saying that looks surprising to me that we would assume that given do you guys know what CPIW is. So we're assuming percentage increases for the, which is lower than yeah. employee groups that we do not have um, agreements in place in alignment with the one agreement that we do have in place, which is with fire for 2024. Okay. So it might be, I don't know if it, I don't know what we can do in executive session or not, but I, it might be helpful so that some, council member doesn't go calculate it on his own. Uh, it might be worth at least knowing what the numbers would actually be if you were closer to CPIW for those that aren't locked in, just so we have a sense of, wait, are we talking about 200 bucks or are we talking about 2 million bucks? Okay. But I take your point, city administrator. I just no, I understand. Need to stay out of we need to stay out of the details. You're right. So, in terms of employee benefits, um, focusing on mandatory benefits, uh, we estimated the wage base for Social Security and paid family medical leave at one hundred sixty one thousand seven hundred dollars for twenty twenty three, as well as an increase to one hundred sixty nine seven hundred eighty five thousand dollars for twenty twenty four. In terms of L and I rates. Uh, we're assuming an increase of 10% for 2023, as well as a 5% increase for 2024. For health premiums, we know that we've settled on, or at least for regents, so we're, except for fire, so most employees are on regents. Um, except, uh, we know that the AWC negotiated a 4.5% increase for 2023. Uh, we've incorporated 6% for 2024, just in case. Our long-term average is roughly 4.8% annually. It's probably for a decade. Um, in terms of dental insurance premiums, we've incorporated 2% for 2023 and 3% for 2024. Those tend to be a lot less than health insurance premiums going up. For pensions itself, uh, we've got the percentages uh, that we've incorporated into our kind of personnel budgeting workbook for employer contributions, uh, roughly 10.25% across the board for 2023 and 2024. Um, we're often employing data from the state actuary to support this, um, and they provide forecasts. Um, things have changed fairly rapidly recently, and so they are reviewing it, and I think they actually pulled uh, their website and what they were proposing. <laughs> so, so there may be some changes forthcoming regarding this um, eventually. So. Hold on to your seats. <laughs> um, in terms of supplies and services, I know we mentioned this when we provide the financial forecast, but we've incorporated 6.6% 6 .6 for 2023 and 2.5% 2 for 2024, just based on the King County economic forecast um, and using the Seattle CPIU basically. And we've provided you with 2025 and 2032 so that when you go take a look at the financial forecast table that we have as part of the appendices of the budget document, these are the percentages that we're using across the board. In terms of revenues, um, property tax. So, yes. Except not across the boards for labor, which is our bigger, biggest cost. So when we, so when we get to 2025, then I'm using the inflationary figures that we okay. see. Cool. I'm just you said for all, and actually, this sort of proves my point. Six point six percent is a much bigger number than you were showing in that earlier chart. Yeah. Okay. So for property tax, uh, we're assuming that the city will collect roughly 98.7% of the property tax revenue expected to be levied for in 2023. We will have two agenda bills before you at the next F&A committee meeting discussing property tax, probably be a fairly large subject area for us in November. 98.7% um, is roughly our, I believe, three-year average of um, how much we actually collect because there are delinquencies that take place out there that where we will not actually collect the property tax revenue. Um, well, I'm not sure. Um, but we always collect it, right? Because it's a lien. So we, we actually we collect it 100%. Right. It's just a timing question. It is a right? timing question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. So, but we have to levy for the full amount. So, no, no, no. I, yeah. What I'm saying is, we've like it can't. It's not ninety eight percent, ninety eight point seven percent over time. It's exactly one hundred percent over time, right? It's just so. Yet some years you'll be above and some below. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So ninety eight point seven. It's delayed, is, right? It's delayed payment, right? Right. That we're going to receive eventually. So you're able to count. You're counting how much I get within the period, as opposed to how much I somehow get later. Right. You're just sort of setting that aside. So we eventually get that. Right. It's just you're saying, but later. counting what you're going to get in the period, you only count ninety eight point seven. Okay. Right. Got it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So shouldn't I be collecting the earlier delinquencies now? So they're leaving that out. So I don't understand why it's not averaging out to hundred percent. Well, it's, so I'm looking at the data, right? I'm pulling from actuals, right? And so compared to what we levy, right? On an annual basis and what we have council set the property tax budget at, we are not collecting that amount on an annual basis. So, so here's what I thought you were going to say before you said what you did. I thought you were going to say, but we don't get 100% because there are exemptions available to certain people like certain seniors can actually get ex- so we're under state law we don't actually get to collect the amount we full the full amount that we levy that's what i thought you were going to say could that be what's going on here that could certainly be a part of this yeah okay mm-hmm. i mean it's so my ex- explanation is probably insufficient right for this and maybe some further digging is required in order to but in essence the 98.7% is something that is, you know, that we're trying to. You might just check that because if that's, that's probably easy enough to track down. I'm pretty sure that what I said is true, but you just check it down because track it down because otherwise grumpy will ask again and other grumpies will ask too, wait a minute, why isn't it 100% over time? So if the answer is no, 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 it's because of these exemptions, then, then everyone will say, okay, got it. Administrative fees from the state. Well, it's not. It's not admin. It's, it's that some people just are allowed to not pay it or pay a lower amount. There's just certain exemptions the state's given to certain people. Yeah. All right. So for 2024, we're assuming a 1.25 percent increase. That includes the one percent council can take plus something for potential development, infill development. Um, in addition, we're assuming that council will approve, like I mentioned, will approve the 1% property tax increase annually and then a small amount. Well, yeah, I just said that. So I won't read the bullet point now. So for sales and B&O tax, we're assuming an increase equal to 1.75% in 2023 and 4.07% in 2024 based on the sales tax forecast from King County. Uh, B&O tax revenue, and I know we mentioned this probably last time that we were here, also includes an amount equal to 1.5 times the cost of the revenue manager. So... There's an expectation that the revenue manager will increase the RBNO tax collections because that is right now based on the honor system and having someone present to help us audit that will probably hopefully generate the additional revenue that we're seeking. I'm just going to ask you, um, so that 1.75% and the 4.07%, those are driven by basically assumptions about the economy. That's what that is, right? That the King County is making which they largely base on the state forecast, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they're saying sort of um, f- flattish slight increase in 23 and then economic growth again in 2024 is what they're saying. Okay, that fits with, I mean, okay, makes sense. I haven't had enough time to investigate what kind of variables that they necessarily deploy as a part of the regression model regarding this, but yes, I'm assuming that what you're stating is correct. No, no, I'm I'm just thinking about this because um, in my company, we don't assess B&O tax, but we do very much make very sophisticated um, estimates of future economic activity, which are changing every month right now. It's, you know, uh, but in any event, uh, I was just sort of, I guess I was talking out loud. I was trying to relate that to what I know to be being used. Um, and it, it's, it's, um, yeah, that ma- matches up. I'm, I'm mumbling because the 1.75% may be a little optimistic, mm-hmm. but the 4.0 back in 2024, that's that that all that all looks right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of utility tax, we're assuming increases based on PSC's rate proposal, which is before the UTC right now regarding electricity and natural gas. 
In the city, city's utility rate schedule for water, sewer, and stormwater, other utilities such as solid waste, cable, and telephone are based on historical averages. Uh, for telephone and cable, that has actually been either relatively steady or decreasing over time uh, because people are cutting the cord. For charges for goods and services, uh, we're including an increase in the Interfund admin overhead charge. I mentioned earlier about charging for supplies and services in addition to personnel. That's something that we're new doing new uh, in this budget, as well as for new ongoing sources of revenue from the proposed comprehensive fee study and ground emergency medical transport billing. When you subtract for the above, the increase is actually equal to a 2.1% increase for 2023 and 4.7% increase for 2024. Um, other kind of general fund revenues, such as licenses and permit fees, intergovernmental revenues, et cetera, assumes a 2.0% increase. Looking at building permits and plan checking fees, we're assuming that 7.5 homes will be constructed in 2023 and issued permits in 20, and 41.5 homes will be constructed and issued permits in 2024. That includes the 13 homes that are going in, I believe right now on Southeast 99th. Yeah. And then we also have um, the sold LDS property as well um, within this too. Um, interest on investments are based on the city's kind of current portfolio of investments at current interest rates. And so uh, we actually explored that more so than we ever have in the past recently, just to see what we potentially collect from that. Um, and then lastly, just to discuss uh, briefly the utility fees, uh, we pulled directly from the utility rate model completed in 2021. And that is based on the city's utility rate schedule and assume increases in ERUs, which is tied to any sort of development or infill development that takes place. Uh, next steps, we're gonna have a budget workshop on November the 1st to deliberate the final 2023-2024 biennial budget. We'll likely have just a, an updated document to you at that time. In terms of ordinances and resolutions that we need to complete, uh, we've got the two property tax ordinances that bring to council. Um, as a part of your agenda packet tonight, we have the uh, proposed 2023-2024 biennial budget ordinance. In order to consolidate all the funds that we're proposing with that chart that you saw previously, we need to bring forward a budget amendment to do so. And then tonight we have um, our finance director, finance and HR director, talking about the salaries and benefits for the management and professional staff. Uh, we also need to work with the city clerk team city clerk as well. Regarding public hearings, um, we'll have a property tax revenue public hearing, a preliminary budget hearing, as well as a final budget hearing as well um, that we'd have to accomplish too. So with that said, happy to entertain any questions and thank you for your patience with me tonight. <laughs> and yes, well done. <laughs> thank you. All right, we have one item left, I think. All right, thank you, Chair Committee. One more item. Um, this is a discussion. Uh, we wanted to present Agenda Bill um, 22150, what I'm calling is a partner agenda bill. Uh, this is a housekeeping item that the council considers every year for setting of the salaries for the non-represented MNP. So I wanted to put that in in front of the uh, FNA committee um, so that you had a, a, a clear view um, of what's being proposed. This is, there were some attachments uh, with this agenda bill. So that was the proposed salary schedule for those non-represented positions at that 3.5% for 2023. Now I did hear, what about 2024? Uh, in our crystal ball, that's something that we do not have, um, and it's uh, the council uh, sets on an annual basis those those salaries. So mm. each year, the, even though there's a biennial budget, each year then the the council has to set those schedules. Uh, so so that's um, the the uh, exhibits that are included with this agenda bill would be that salary schedule with a comparison of 2022 to 2023. Uh, also exhibit two, um, we, are, we are working on putting together better documentation, um, uh, better tools for employees to understand what their benefits are. Um, exhibit two to this agenda bill includes an overview. We're putting together a benefits handbook. Um, and so this is what we're calling the one pager of those benefits that are uh, provided for 
uh, non-represented employees. Um, we're looking to add in from a retention standpoint, uh, we're looking to add in um, uh, long-term disability. Uh, this is a, a, a coverage that the, the city has not provided. Mm. Um, when we are, and we're in the middle of the class and compensation study. And so what we found as we're in that is uh, comparably, um, Snoqualmie does, uh, is one of the only communities that does not offer that as a benefit. It's a relatively low cost. We did include that uh, in the budget um, proposal before you. Um, we are also looking to shift to a more flexible leave situation and that's paid time off. Um, that is a, a common uh, leave uh, for uh, folks uh, instead of vacation uh, and sick leave. And so once we get into the negotiations with bargaining units, if they are if they are asking for that kind of leave, that's something that we would that would be bargained for. But for the non-rep folks, we're we're looking to get into more flexible and more modern uh, leave opportunities. Sarah, in the program that you're proposing, is there a max approval or a all right, and that's spelled out in there. If we can. Uh, yes, it is okay, spelled. It. it would be spelled out in there, uh, and then. Um, and, uh, and so, how it would work, I assume, is sorry, is um, they'd accrue up to a point, and then they would just stop accruing once they hit that point. There, there wouldn't be a, a lose it situation. They would just stop accruing until such time as they were below the max. That's correct. Got it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, with that, with a with a paid time off program, also short term disability. Again, it's a small. Uh, cost, but it, oftentimes when you're shifting from sick leave vacation, uh, then um, employees are concerned that how do I, uh, you know, I use that, that's like, that's my vacation, or they're used to a sick leave balance. Well, a short-term disability policy bridges that gap. Uh, it's a small cost to the employer. And so uh, for folks who uh, would have a longer term illness or something, where they'd have to use that PTO balance, um, then they would be instead shifting on to an insurance uh, program versus having to use all their leave uh, just because of, you know, the, it doesn't go very far uh, with those balances uh, uh, when there is a, a major illness or something. Uh, we're also proposing, um, Christian, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to ask, does that also include parental leave if someone has a baby or adopts? Um, they, well, they, yes, they would be able to um, use the their pay time, pay time off, but there is already current uh, for the uh, paid family medical leave that they can utilize some of those other leave uh, plans uh, for any kind of maternity. Is that uh, a state leave. program though? Uh, That's a state program, is that correct? That is a state, yeah, state yeah. program. So we this would be in addition to, they would have um, what we're calling a more, uh, a better, uh, a higher accrual level so that they could uh, accrue and maybe they're, they're planning. Uh, so they're going to want to. Ha they're going to have a, a a larger balance available for taking that time off. So they're so they're um, not concerned about having to take leave without pay. Good. Thank so you. that's the goal. Uh, another benefit is uh, to. Sorry, if I could just oh. ask about that, I just yeah. realized. So of course that's just an unfunded liability, isn't it? Because we're cash basis, we don't actually fund that liability, do we? Uh, that's correct. Huh. Currently, with our vacation, we do. I mean, that is an unfunded yeah. liability as yeah. well. Yeah. Yes. Huh. I hate the cash basis. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to mention as a cost saver, we want we're we're looking to offer an opt out uh, uh, of our medical plan. Uh, this is one way uh, uh, it, to find some savings. Uh, we are looking through the budgets, you know, to to stop doing. Uh, and start doing. Uh, and this is one of the ways where if there's an employee who has coverage through their uh, their partner, their spouse, uh, that they can get that coverage there, but then they can share in that cost and it's a 50% savings um, uh, to the city. So it's very, it's very popular. AWC Benefit uh, the Trust has some limits so no more than 25% of our total FTEs. Um, I've never seen where where uh, a community has bumped up to that, but nonetheless, it, it does generate cost savings. And, and so we are anticipating um, some cost savings there to uh, all funds, across all operating funds. Uh, and with that, just wanted to make sure that you were um, aware of what we're, let's see, Drew covered the retirement uh, 
And that is the attachment to, uh, to this. Uh, and then I wanted to uh, also uh, bring forward, this is in the budget, in the 23-24 budget document, but this is the uh, budget staffing, the authorized FTE. I just wanted to uh, put this in front of you uh, in a way for you to see it uh, uh, across all departments um, so that you can see you've heard Drew talk about a proposed staffing increase of 6.75 FTEs. And so you can see that where we are, we're proposing some trade-offs of a position so it doesn't increase, but nonetheless, you can see where we are proposing those new positions. Uh, just, a, just another kind of reminder of what's included in the budget. So that is uh, staffing and then of course, um, salary and benefits for those non-represented folks. So that's 6.7. This is not filling of vacant positions. This is new positions above and beyond those vacant positions. 6.75 is proposed new positions, correct? So this agenda bill, is a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a much bigger thing. This is not just 3.5% pay raises, all those benefit changes? Um, yes. So those, those benefit changes, so in... Uh, what typically comes before the council is a resolution setting the salary and benefits for non-represented right. employees. But this sounds like this is going to be a much bigger thing this time. Um, well, it's it's the salary. And so these benefits and in the agenda bill, um, and let me just go back there uh, to this, where in the agenda bill, um, adding the long-term um, disability insurance. Um, and this looks like an old one here. This looks like an, or, an original one because there is a cost for that short-term disability insurance. And this is just for non-represented uh, again. Um, there is a estimated savings and we'll provide the updated agenda bill uh, here for you. There's a cost savings estimated at about $70,000 uh, for that opt-out program. Uh, that uh, is then um, balanced with the additional costs for disability insurance. Uh, and then, of course, we've laid out what those changes are for those accrual balances. Currently, the vacation uh, is varied, uh, but nonetheless, it's proposed that there would be a fixed max amount for uh, paid time off. Uh, so these are um, the, the proposed changes um, that we have included in the budget. Right. So I'm just asking because what is traditionally or historically been a pretty straightforward agenda bill where we're just approving some raises now, it's become now it's burdened with a lot of things that, you know, all these benefit changes, which is not normally what this agenda. And that's a lot for people to have to think through and try and evaluate. Like, I, I, why aren't these being separated into two separate things? Why are we lump like we're just adding a lot onto what otherwise would have been a straightforward agenda bill? If you'd like to separate out benefits um, into its own agenda bill, that's <laughs> something that we can do, and we can keep the the salary adjustment table to one agenda bill. We can separate them if you. So my preference is to separate it because I want to take something that I think is non-controversial and let's get it done. Mm -hmm. And then something else, which just is going to take some more thought by folks, including me. I'm not saying that, but, but let's just separate that out and do it as a separate matter. It doesn't stop us budgeting for it, but to actual just approve it, maybe have it as a separate matter that we can just then look at these changes and say, okay, that's what's going on. In, in other words, separate them as two different topics that just get taken separately, which may as separate matters be fine, but going together may cause it to be so complex that it bogs down. That would be my recommendation. Let's split these into two separate agenda bills. I agree. I, I'm agreeable with that. I just, would I, that be I, okay? I the that's, that's fine. Um, my, it, my experience in other communities is I've I've packaged them together for non-rep 
so that the council could set the salaries and benefits for those for for that employee group. But if you wish to separate them, then that's uh, that's, that's. I recommend doable. let let's separate them if that's agreeable because I think then I just think that'll be a better path through for the for all of it together because we're not used to doing that other thing. Let us just do that separately, and then I, I just think that'll work a lot better. We can separate them. That's all that I have. All right. And then, um, so let's see, what uh, are you wanting that agenda bill or two agenda bills? Are you wanting that on this coming council? Uh, uh, no, no, you were giving us a, a, a preview of it. I was giving you a preview. <laughs> okay. So so that you weren't surprised, but um, these are partner agenda bills with the budget ordinance. Okay. So then let, then let me suggest this. Fine. We had this discussion about separating them. Let's just leave it sit for now. Let us look at those and see if we have questions for you because we'll be able to talk about it at our next committee meeting. Is that correct? We have the November uh, 1st uh, full council discussion of the budget. So we could add it in under the topics. Um, I think it's worked uh, well to have the budget and then specific topics that we're going to talk about. So we could do it there. Um, I do want to get you the um, agenda bill that had that estimated cost for this new benefit, estimated savings. And so you could actually see, um, because it is in the agenda bill. So uh, that's that's something if if you're agreeable to that, then we could add that specific topic on November 1 for discussion with well, It doesn't council. hurt to discuss it, but I, I just, it would just be, um, you might want to, anyway, um, doesn't hurt to discuss it, but to the extent that it might it might be helpful if this committee's in a position to weigh in and say, you know, we're recommending this or that the other council members might find that helpful and might cause you to spend less time on it. You decide. Well, we could put it then on the next uh, FNA committee meeting. Yeah, that that would be my recommendation because I honestly on no no at our uh, November for I'm losing track it's until late one, but November eighth yeah I'm just saying there's so much to cover there anyway yeah there's so much to cover there anyway that if and and definitely keep the 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 three and a half percent in okay. I think this other the benefits thing is sort of more of a like maybe you get us sort of bought off on that and then that might help with when that goes forward yes we can do that. Thank you. All right. There's no other business there's tonight. Presentations. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, all staff, city administrator on down for staying so late with us tonight. And I know you're doing this. I know this is a busy time with a lot of late, a lot of meetings and a lot of late meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Night. Thank you. Yes. You saw me looking right at you guys, right? You, <laughs> you know, I was looking right at you. Okay. As well as, yeah. Anyway, if there's uh, no objection, then uh, we'll adjourn. Seeing no objection, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.